You've faced questions today on a very, very raw subject. There has never been an interview like this before. This interview has been exceptionally rare. You might not speak on this subject again. Is there anything you feel has been left unsaid that you would like to say now? I'm Scott Rouse, my body language expert and analyst. I train law enforcement and the military in interrogation and body language. Hi there, I'm Mark Bowden. I'm an expert in human behavior and body language. I'm Greg Hartley. I'm a former Army interrogator and interrogation resistance instructor. Hi, I'm Chase Hughes. I retired from the U.S. military and now develop programs and teach interrogation behavior profiling. Better. Well, today we're going to be talking uh, about Prince Andrew and his body language during his interview. As we go through this, remember, we call him like we see him. We're not leaning to one side politically or the other side. If we're uh, from one country or another country, we're not going to lead toward the, toward either side. We call them like we see them. So that's what's going on. So let's start off with uh, the first question. See you today. As you say, all of this goes back to your friendship with Jeffrey Epstein. Mm. How did you first become friends? How did you meet? Well, I met through his girlfriend. Um, back in 1999, who um, and I'd known her since uh, she was at university uh, in the UK. Um, and it would be, to some extent, a stretch to say that, that um, uh, as it were, we were close friends. I mean, we were friends because of other people. Um, and I had a lot of opportunity to um, uh, go to the United States, um, but I didn't have much time with him. I suppose I saw him once or twice a year, perhaps maybe maximum of three times a year. And um, quite often, if I was in the United States and doing things, it, and if he wasn't there, he would say, well, why don't you come and use my houses? So I said, that's very kind. Thank you very much indeed. Um, but it would be, it would be um, a, a, a considerable stretch to say that he was a very, very close friend. But he had the most extraordinary um, ability to bring um, uh, extraordinary people together uh, and that's the bit that I remember is going to the dinner parties where you would meet academics politicians people from the United Nations I mean it was a it was a is a, a cosmopolitan group of what I would describe as as US um, eminence all right so who wants to go first Greg yeah so I'll jump on two things and then it, it may bleed into three number one you it would be a stretch to characterize us as close friends evolves to it would be a considerable stretch to characterize us as very, very close friends. Hmm. That's an interesting distancing from the situation, number one. Here's one of those, and Chase, we'll both be on this one from different angles. This is one of those points where he's nodding very rapidly, yes, about being a friend, and then suddenly preparing because he knows what's coming, pushing his tongue out of his mouth. And this is not a grooming move as much, you know, cleaning your mouth as almost distasteful, pushing his tongue out. Of course, his routine is a little bit of that, but watching from here, that first start, and you'll see as he progresses through this, fight or flight's going to start hitting him, and you'll get mucosal fatigue and all that, and we'll talk about it as it shows up. But those two things are my first two. Chase, what do you got? There's a lot here. So just focus on a couple of things. We have this lip compression, the moment that the person's name is memorized or, or mentioned. We see the lips squeezed together, which typically means withheld opinions or something's kind of being withheld. And we're also getting a little bit of a baseline here because we're starting out the video and, you know, Greg talks a lot about baseline. So we're looking, he's accessing a genuine memory and he looks over to his left. So we're kind of just starting to get this little baseline behavior. And when he says United States, he's using this hand, he's gesturing that direction when he's going to America. So these are important little things to pay attention to for the rest of the interview. And one thing you'll notice when you have an HD video, it's really, really cool. The artery underneath the knee causes the foot to bounce with the heartbeat. So what we'll do, I'll throw it in the comments here. I'll throw his heartbeat throughout the entire interview, which I've spent time calculating <laughs> in the comments of the video. You, Chase, it's a beautiful thing because I've been watching it the entire video myself, watching right. his pulse rate. It's a beautiful thing. I, that's I, why I was, right. that's I, why I was waiting to the end. I was going to goose it with that. But I <laughs> wondered which handler let him sit that way in full camera view. Like, Mark, you're 
Your people are letting yeah, you. Yeah, well, uh, let, me tell, let me tell you about this. Um, his handlers have abandoned him at this point. And here's how I think we can tell that. Just look at his tie. His tie is askew. A handler would have never have let that go. So let's look at the bigger context that we have here. We're in the Royal Palace. That's not his house. That's his mother's house. It's the seat of the Crown of England. It's a place of high authority where he's trying to get extreme compliance from this interviewer. And he's trying to do it by striking awe. As you walk into that room, you just need to look at the China collection at the back. You've got priceless paintings all around you. He's basically saying you will comply because look at the authority that rests here. Um, Maitlis, uh, to counter this, has shown up in a military-style jacket, knowing, I think, so there are no accidents here. There are conscious and unconscious choices. She's shown up in a military jacket, hoping for some compliance around that, that he'll see the braids, he'll see the military style, and although he's a vice admiral himself, there will be an element of compliance to that idea of military and uh, rank signals, essentially. Though, of course, we don't expect that he thinks she holds any rank. However, in the UK, she would be one of the top interviewers in hard news. So she's a strong contender here. So I just want to lay that out and just, you know, let you know, I think he's been abandoned at this point. He's on his own because handlers would have come in and they'd have adjusted that time. I just want to make two other points about this. Uh, Greg, the the uh, the stretch. We actually see him do a, a descriptor of that stretch. And, and it, it is, he doesn't make it a huge stretch. He makes it a little bit of a stretch. But later on in the interview, we're going to see him do a stretch again, and we're going to see his hands clasped together, and he won't describe a stretch. So it's a good, a good chance for a baseline on that. And I just want to put one more thing down. He says, that's the bit that I remember, and that stresses on I. And I think at this point, to your point at the start, Scott, he's just laid down his complete strategy, which is, I remember this, and I'm not going to remember other stuff. So he's, he's, he's already gone, here's, here's my strategy, I'm going to forget stuff. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think that's the way it's laid out. You can tell he's been hanging with some high-end lawyers because that's the perfect setup for that whole thing. <clears throat> right out of the gate, he says, when she says, you know, how did y'all meet her? He says, I met. He doesn't say, I met him. He doesn't say, say we met. <clears throat> he says, I met. And that distances him from him from word one, from the right out of the gate, I met at. And then he describes how it's done. We're, we're talking about that foot sticking out as well. And it's really important, not just for the heart, for the heartbeat, but he's using it as a barrier as well. So I'll be pointing those out as we go through, because as he gets to some points, you see it go dank as he tries to subconscious psychologically block what's coming at him. It's, it's, this is, and these angles they've done with this are perfect. And they're not just honing in on her. Like we saw in the Megan Kelly thing. It's not about Megan Kelly. And it's not about this interviewer. It's about the interviewee. So this is a, this is going to be a, this is going to be a great, uh, learning exercise for the, the person that wants to learn about uh, body language. All of this goes back to your friendship with Jeffrey Epstein. Mm. How did you first become friends? How did you meet? Well, I met through his girlfriend um, back in 1999, who, um, and I'd known her since uh, she was at university in the UK. Um, and it would be, to some extent, a stretch to say that, that um, uh, as it were, we were close friends. I mean, we were friends because of other people. Um, and I had a lot of opportunity to um, uh, go to the United States, um, but I didn't have much time with him. I suppose I saw him once or twice a year, perhaps maybe maximum of three times a year. And um, quite often, if I was in the United States and doing things, it, and if he wasn't there, he would say, well, why don't you come and use my houses. So I said, that's very kind. Thank you very much indeed. Um, but it would be, it would be um, a, a, a considerable stretch to say that he was a very, very close friend. But he had the most extraordinary um, ability to bring um, uh, extraordinary people together. Uh, and that's the bit that I remember, is going to the dinner parties where 
you would meet academics, politicians, people from the United Nations. I mean, it was a, it was a, it was a cosmopolitan group of what I would describe as, as U.S. Um, eminence. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Go to the next one. It was, a, it, was a, it was a cosmopolitan group of what I would describe as, as U.S. Um, eminence. Was that his appeal then? Was that yeah. what you... Because you, you were perceived by the public as being the party prince. Was that something well, you I shared? Well, I think that's um, also um, a bit of a stretch. Um, I don't know why I've, I've, I've um, uh, collected that title, because I don't... I, I never have really parted. Um, uh, I was single for quite a long time um, in the early 80s. Um, uh, but then after I got married, I was um, very happy um, and, and, and I've, I've never really felt the need to go and party. And certainly going to um, Jeffrey's was not about partying. Absolutely not. All right. Well, here's what I'm seeing right out of the, right out of the gate on that one. When uh, he shakes his head no while he's saying yes. That's after right there the first question. And then... Um, he says, I've never felt the need to party. And you see the classic half shrug that goes into that. Um, again, about his foot. Um, it's not about partying. That's when his foot goes up for the first time. We see that, that, that blockage go up. Then you see, we see his limbic system kicking in because he's starting to dawn on him. Or he's starting to feel just a little bit of heat at that point. His nostrils flare a little bit. And his eyes close. Just, and his eyes close all the way, actually. And when he's finished giving this statement, you can, as he's doing this, he's rubbing his fingers like at, in the fashion of, okay, there's one down of accomplishment, an accomplishment, in other words, when you get, when you see that. So he's, he gives that a sigh of relief as he's going through, ah, got through that one. That went well. And Chase, you're right. When he's looking over to our right, that's when he's recalling what he's heard. Now, you know, my feelings on, uh, I accessing, uh, you can correct you, but, uh, you know, what are you going to do? That's where he's going for remembering things anyway. That's where his eyes, that's where his eyes head. So what are you seeing, Mark? Yeah. So, so nice baseline there on, on, um, that was his appeal. Yeah. So he does an upward inflection on that. Uh, I think he's jumping there on this gift of compliance. Yeah. And, and we're going to see this later on. And I think what we're going to see is the interviewer cleverly use that signal of, I just won, to then move in for the attack. Because she knows at this point she's got him optimistic about this. So that was his appeal. Yeah. And up his voice goes and he jumps on this gift. He's got to comply to that point. Now we see at this point that second, that's a bit of a stretch. But instead of doing the descriptor, he's now clasped together. My guess would be is that means that uh, it's, it's, a different, it's a different stretch from the first stretch. In fact, it's not a stretch. Else he would have described it, I believe, in, in some way. Um, oh, we see his blink rate go up, and I'm sure Chase will, um, will, will talk about uh, that. Um, I think we hear... The, the name of Jeffrey used in just, uh, just, just Jeffrey, not Epstein, Jeffrey. And the tonality of it seems to feel quite friendly. Yeah. Um, so let me leave it. Let me leave it there. Okay. Chase, what do you got? We see a lot in this. We're going to see a lot in all these. Yeah. But we, we got a really good baseline here about how he has truthful conversations. He's talking about, when he was younger and when he was married, he makes about 50% eye contact. So when we're talking to a person, anytime you talk to a person, we ask them a few questions that, that are general, that they have no reason to lie to. And we see that when he's being truthful, he looks off to the side and he makes less eye contact. So he tends to make a ton, like 100% just about, of eye contact when he's trying to be a little bit deceptive. We also have another thing here this is the first, he mentions Jeffrey's name in a very friendly way, but it's also the only time you will ever hear it. And, okay. and this is in, in our field, this is something we call psychological distancing or severity softening, where we don't say the person's name. I did not have sex with that woman. Phrases like that. Greg, what do you got? 
Yeah, a few things. One, he's redefining party. If you notice, it's his stress word in the entire thing. What he defines as party and what you define as party, I would guarantee would be different. And his idea of partying is probably back to your, your tiger thing. They might be clowns involved. So this is one of those times that he's redefining that word if you listen to the stress. He does something I call sacred space. He's closed up and he starts to mill his hands. That's an adapter and a barrier. What you're doing, and the reason I call it sacred space, is you're taking control, giving yourself a new place, giving yourself room, and then making familiar the unfamiliar. And it is a comforting move, but also a blocking move to give yourself some room. He drops his chin, he has his chin down, his brow up, his eyes are closed, and his respiration increases. And you'll notice he's drifting, when he opens his eyes, he's drifting down to the left. Down to the left is a different place than directly left. When a person's accessing memory, typically on their left, and now this is where, Scott, I do believe in eye movement, and I do think it's powerful, you need to baseline someone. But if I ask you to calculate 15% of 980 and you try it, you're going to find an internal conversation about math going on in your head, and your eyes are going to drift slightly down into your left in most people. Now you baseline each person and figure it out, but over and over and over, when he's walking through a minefield, you see that activity, that down left, as he's thinking about what to say next and walking through it. I agree with you 100%, Mark, that in the case of him going, yeah, he just felt a bite on the line and he's going to let her run with it and he's teasing her to get her to go. This is a great start down the tunnel. She understands what's happening. He doesn't think she does. And the last thing I'll leave you at You can see the flirt in him here. You can certainly see the flirt when he makes eye contact and he turns his head, but still keeps eye contact and then draws that pulling taffy move. That's the flirt, right? That's the draw you into my space and make it remembering that he is after all a real prince, not a fairy tale prince, right? Excellent. Anybody else? Yeah. I mean, yeah. One thing I want to put on this is, is, is in the business of lying, you can't be lazy about it. If you're going to lie, you've really got to have a good understanding of what evidence is out there. When it comes to, you know, I'm, I'm not really anybody who really parted. Just, just there's too much evidence that that's not accurate. And so uh, everything from now on has been diminished for him because we have an image of Andrew in our head and he's suggesting that uh, we're not right. Well, this is, this is kind of a gaslighting tactic. He's going, no, reality isn't as you've seen it for the last several decades. Well, that's going to be hard for, the, the, for public opinion to stomach. It was, a, it, was a, it was a cosmopolitan group of what I would describe as, as U.S. Um, eminence. But was that his appeal then? Was yeah. that what you, because you, you were perceived by the public as being the party prince. Was that something well, you I shared? Well, I think that's um, also um, a bit of a stretch. Um, I don't know why I've, I've, I've um, uh, collected that title because I don't, I, I never have really parted. Um, uh, I was single for quite a long time um, in the early 80s. Um, uh, but then after I got married, I was um, very happy um, and, and, and I've, I've never really felt the need to go and party. And certainly going to um, Jeffrey's was not about partying. Absolutely not. Okay. Anybody else? All right. Good. Absolutely not. You said you weren't very good friends, but would you describe him as a good friend? Did you trust him? Uh, yes, I think I probably did, but uh, again, um, I, mean, I don't go into um, a friendship looking for the wrong thing, if you understand what I mean. I mean I'm, I'm, a, I'm an engaging person. I want to be able to engage. I want to find out. I want to learn. Um, uh, and so uh, you have to remember that I was transitioning out of the Navy at the time, um, and in the transition, uh, I wanted to, to find out more about what was going on because in the Navy, um, uh, it's a pretty isolated business because you're out at sea the whole time. Um, and I was going to become the special representative for international trade and investment. So I wanted to know more about what was going on in the international business world. And so that was another reason 
for going there. And the opportunities that I had to go to Wall Street and other places to learn uh, whilst I was there were, were absolutely vital. All right, Mark, you go first. Yeah, so what I want to hit on here is just how he's trying to control this using authority. And I think what I've heard Greg and Chase talk about kind of reading out the, the resume. Um, and, um, and this idea of, well, so he starts with, if, if you understand what I mean, so it's pretty condescending. So he's trying to get compliance by going, if you don't join in with this train of thought, my guess is, is you're probably not smart enough to really understand this because you have to remember. So there's a real instruction there. You have to remember because it's vital. So he's laying down really clear words of compliance. And then he goes into, because in the Navy, Wall Street, um, he's reading out this resume of why you would agree with him right now. And, and many people might think, well, isn't that just kind of verbal tactics? Well, for me, it is nonverbal tactics because he's trying to create an atmosphere around himself. Uh, something that will cause a sense of authority around him and gain compliance. Excellent. Greg? Yeah, so we're close on this one, Mark. I call him Moses come down from the mountain. He's a life of service. He's done all these things for you. Navy more than one time with a heavy influence. This, I needed to learn new things so I could even be a better servant to, to the British people. I mean, it, that whole life of service is here. I think she lets him off the hook a little bit. He feels that lack of pressure and he starts to be who he really is and to talk more normally. I don't see a whole lot of deception here to you. The same thing. Exactly. I see he's building this aura around himself and he's Moses come down from the mountain. Exactly. Chase, what do you got? I think he secretly reveals a lot during this. And he said, he starts off by saying, I don't go into a friendship looking for the wrong thing, which may indicate why did you become friends with this person? And he is feeling persecuted because of, because of that. So that's his first, first line of defense is to say that. And we notice there's a little more distancing. There's no pronouns when he refers to Epstein here. And throughout the statement, you know, he's, he's talking about the naval career. There's a little bit of a uh, shoulder shrug. And we start to see a repetitive pattern that you'll see throughout the entire video when he needs some reassurance, which he does a lot throughout this interview. You'll see a big eyebrow flash and makes my contact a big eyebrow flash and make sure that he gets that. Uh, he's, he's kind of communicating uncertainty. To, to make sure the other person nods. And she does very frequently to help him keep moving along. Okay, keep it short. I'm seeing a lot of, of, of truth here. So I'm not, I mean, there are some things that are iffy, but still, I think there's more uh, truth indicators than anything in this part. Agreed. So, I do think he's being honest about one thing. This guy Epstein, the only reason that he had the power he had is because he had the ability to coordinate all these meetings. And I do believe that there's real value in that to Andrew. Now, and Chase, to your point, when he said, I don't seek out bad things, doesn't mean bad things didn't come as a part of it. That's right. a different discussion. So I think sometimes when you're, in, when you're interviewing people, they inadvertently give you all the building blocks and you have to figure out how it all goes together. But I do think that all these celebrities and all of these wealthy and powerful people didn't go to Epstein because he was Epstein, but because of who he could connect them with. He's LinkedIn, right? Yeah, yeah. And that's what gives him the want to say that. So, hey, I was going, everybody else is doing it. I'm yep. doing it too. And there's a reason I'm doing it because I need to for business. So for who I am. Absolutely not. You said you weren't very good friends, but would you describe him as a good friend? Did you trust him? Uh, uh, yes, I think I probably did. But uh, again, um, I, mean, I don't go into... Um, a friendship looking for the wrong thing, if you understand what I mean. I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an engaging person. I want to be able to engage. I want to find out. I want to learn. Um, and so, 
uh, you have to remember that I was transitioning out of the Navy at the time. Um, and in the transition, uh, I wanted to, to find out more about what was going on. Because in the Navy, um, uh, it's a pretty isolated business because you're out at sea the whole time. Um, and I was going to become the Special Representative for International Trade and Investment. So I wanted to know more about what was going on in the international business world. And so that was another reason for going there. And the opportunities that I had to go to Wall Street and other places to learn uh, whilst I was there were, were absolutely vital. That we good? Yep. All right. Was there were, were absolutely vital. He was your guest as well. In 2000, Epstein was a guest at Windsor Castle and at Sandringham. He was brought right into the heart yes, of the but, royal family at your but, invitation. But uh, certainly at my invitation, not at the royal family's invitation, but remember that it was his girlfriend that was the key element in this. He was the, as it were, plus one to some extent in, 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 that, in that. So I think right, yeah, right in that one, He's, it's really important to him to shut down that that whole bit about he came into the you know into the bowels of the of the royal family so he had to get he had to he starts in on that earlier with that but 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 stuff Greg what do you got yeah so a couple of things right off he does something that Trump is very good at it's that condescending pause and slow and overpronounce for example when asked why he called it the Chinese virus he said it he says because it's from China. This is the same exact move. And this is by Prince Andrew. Put him side by side with Trump and you'll see the same body language, that slow pitch across the teeth, that condescending look at the same time. And he's parsing facts. This is one of those places where if I can take some of your facts apart, then your story has no value. And we've all done this in an interrogation room or in a body language session where a guy starts to say, well, I didn't kill four people. I killed two people, so your story's broken. No matter how ludicrous it is, you start taking the story apart by taking the underpinnings out of it. And then he starts this whole plus one. He's trying to get back to some kind of normal, and I'll leave it at that. Chase? I think he's looking for confirmation from the other person again. There's a couple of confirmation glances, and this just happens when a person makes a statement and then looks up in the middle of it or right afterwards to make sure you bought it. But... Uh, most of it's truthful. I think he's trying to redirect the narrative and we're setting up for the, for the, he wasn't my friend. She was. Excellent. Mark, what do you got? Yeah. So that jump on the, um, on the invite to, uh, to, I think Sandringham may, it may have been, uh, and saying that it was him, not the Royal family, not the queen. And so it's really important for him at this point, not to involve the monarch. Uh, once that happens, um, he's he's potentially as good as dead. So, mm -hmm. so he's he's and and clearly, I would say from that, he is not supported at this point. He has no support from the monarch. If there was support, he would be saying it was a it was a royal event, um, and then it would be unquestionable. But at this point, uh, it really is a case of. Another example, I think, of he's out on his own right now. So he's, is he surrendering his immunity of sorts almost in, in that way? And that then could explain some of this cascading of body language that's starting to occur right after this, Mark. I mean, I'm just asking you, please don't, you know, I've put that in, Scott. I just, because I don't know anything about royal family, really. Yeah. Yeah, so so the royal family has a, has a history of having to save itself every now and again. It has to save itself and, and keep uh, the UK as a constitutional monarchy which means that the monarch has power, but not really. Right. Um, and, and this would be a great example of him really understanding that there's no way that he can involve the monarch. And yet at the same time, he's borrowed his mum's house. <laughs> well, and I, and I, don't think, I don't think she knows. Um, were, were absolutely vital. He was your guest as well. In 2000, Epstein was a guest at Windsor Castle and at Sandringham. He was brought right into the heart yes, of the but, royal family at your but, invitation. But uh, certainly at my invitation, not at the royal family's invitation, but remember that it was his girlfriend 
that was the key element in this. He was the, as it were, plus one to some extent in, 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 that, in that. Is everybody good? All right. There were, were absolutely vital. He was your guest as well. In 2000, Epstein was a guest at Windsor Castle and at Sandringham. He was brought right into the heart yes, of the but, royal family at your but, invitation. But uh, certainly at my invitation, not at the royal family's invitation, but remember that it was his girlfriend that was the key element in this. He was the, as it were, plus one to some extent in, 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 that, in that. This is my favorite one. Am I right in thinking you, you threw a, a birthday party um, for Epstein's girlfriend, Galen Maxwell, at Sandringham? No, it was a shooting weekend. A shooting weekend. Just a straightforward, straightforward shooting weekend. But during these times that he was a guest at Windsor Castle at Sandringham, uh, the shooting weekend, yep, yeah, yeah. we now know that he was and had been procuring young girls for sex trafficking. We now know that. At the time, there was no indication to me or anybody else that that was what he was doing. All right, that's my favorite one. It's, it's just like a Ricky Gervais bit. I mean, I've seen that a thousand times on everything he's ever done. He does that one bit right there. He's, he's comically bracing himself for that whole thing. He goes into, everything moves and he gets ready. He bra literally braces himself for that thing to happen. You see his foot go up as a barrier when, when he's talking about that. His hands, of course, clasp to, because everything's going, oh, here we go. Because I don't think he knows how to quite, he's got an answer, but that's not the answer he was going to use. Because he's, re he's got his rehearsed stuff that he was shown or, or rehearsed and practiced and told to say. But I don't think that's what he's doing there. And his eyebrows are up for that request of approval. Greg's always talking about. So he's waiting to, he's sort of saying, you believe it? Do you believe it? So Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so you hit most of them, but. That preparation for defense, he's looking up right, he's ramping himself, embracing, he breaks eye contact to come back, you know, come back as a warrior coming back at her. No indication to me, the longest vowel in the entire conversation is me, emphasizing me. And then he says, or anybody else, he quickly fills in with a lilt at the end, asking for approval, his brow is up. And then, yeah, there's a, there's a follow on, I don't know if we're gonna cover it, Scott, if we do cut this piece, but then he says, and if there was, and if there was. Okay, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so let's see whether we cover that if there was, but there's a huge swallow gesture oh, yeah. there on that, and then a then a, a, a bunch of resume, <laughs> I'm good. which, which we should stuff. go into. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but let me let me go let me go back a little bit, which is um, that no, uh, so it was just a just a, a, a shooting weekend, you know, a, a straightforward shooting shooting weekend weekend, and that no that comes before it is what we call condescension because it is literally with a descent, condescent. It's with a descent, and this idea of going from high to low and showing I'm high status and you're low status. It's there again to get compliance from the interviewer. Uh, you know, luckily she's, she's, well not luckily, she's done a lot of work on being too good for him. Uh, so it's, it's not, she's not complying with it at this point. I'll, I'll hold back on, on some other ideas because I think hopefully we'll have some follow-ons. Chase, what do you get? Right here we have a large inhale right into the chest. There's a postural shift. There's digital flexion, which just means the fingers are squeezing in towards the hands. And we have a temporary gaze aversion, which is when we're making eye contact with somebody, they ask me a question and I, and I do this right before I answer, which are all deceptive markers. But those things need to kind of combine together like Legos to, for us to say that's probably deception. But they came together pretty damn well in this one. Yep. And one other fact if you're looking at somebody breathing, if you watch a human sleeping, their belly will go up and down, not their chest. Relaxed people, and he's been on camera all the time. We shouldn't explain away the nervousness from the cameras. Relaxed people breathe into their abdomen, and stressed people breathe into their chest. And it's pretty easy to see in any conversation. We see this big breath into the chest. Later in the conversation, when he gets more comfortable, it goes right into the abdomen. Excellent. 
Very good. Yeah, yeah, one last thing. As we're watching him throughout this entire thing, Chase, I love the fact you pick up on that chest rising. As you're watching this thing, anytime his back is turned or anytime he's in an oblique, watch his respiration increasing because it gets pretty damn fast moving over the next few few minutes. Yeah, because we're going to talk about his, his uh, pulse rate here in a few minutes, Chase. But at one point, I think I'm clocking it right. I know it's hits 90 up, 90 around the seventh question right there. I could be wrong about that because I kept looking and looking and looking. But, man, he's he's burning through through some of that heart rate wise. At, I think uh, I, exactly at 13 minutes, he is 103. Okay. Mm. Yeah. And I think, I think, uh, we're coming at this point to a moment of a first real score where there's a real turnaround for me in the, in the interview and, and the interviewer interrogator really scores a triumph. That's pretty- Am I right in thinking you, you threw a, a birthday party, um, for Epstein's girlfriend, Galen Maxwell at Sandringham? No, it was a shooting weekend. A shooting weekend. Just a straightforward, straightforward shooting weekend. But during these times that he was a guest at Windsor Castle at Sandringham, uh, the shooting weekend, yep, yep, yep. we now know that he was and had been procuring young girls for sex trafficking. We now know that. At the time, there was no indication to me or anybody else, that that was what he was doing. Okay. You have to remember that at the time, um, I was patron of the NSPCC's Full Stop campaign, so I was close up with what was going on in those um, uh, time about getting rid of abuse to, to children. So I knew what was what the what the things were to look for, but I never saw them. So you would have made that connection because you stayed with him, you were a visitor, a guest on many occasions at his homes, mm. and nothing, nothing struck you as suspicious. No. Nothing. During that whole time. Nothing. Just for the record. All right. Chase, what do you got? We see a lot here. And in this video we see him start to develop his narrative and we see a little more lip licking behavior which we call hygienic gestures we see the stroking of the hands back and forth and this is a pacifying gesture i think it's meant to calm him down a little bit he knows the questions are getting a little bit more difficult and you'll typically see him do this for the rest of the interview after he answers a difficult question to kind of calm himself back down And you'll see his hands and feet go crazy. And the further a body part is from the head, the harder it is to control when you've got adrenaline flowing through you. So his foot is in a great spot for an interrogator uh, to watch that happen. Excellent. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so a couple of things. He does steepling, you know, this thing where you put your hands up this way. And everybody who's ever watched The Simpsons, Mr. Burns is like, excellent. You know, it's an authority figure. It's also a compromising thing because your hands rotate as you're feeling more and more compromised as I want to agree with you my hands will do that and then even you'll see people's hands upside down as as they feel compromised I have a great picture Mark of Tony Blair standing in front of Condoleezza Rice with his hands down like that really bad idea so it's a it's a gimme if you're a body language guy then a person starts doing this I love it because I can watch your hands rotate as I get control it's a wonderful tool Um, and you can see him also grinding his fingertips to your point, Chase, he's starting to adapt, trying to get comfortable. He'll rub. But he's, he's trying to contain that body language in his fingertips. Somebody's coached him to pay attention. He, there's also, he says in here, I, he takes holy ground again. I was the saint looking out for children who are being abused. And later in the same interview says, well, I wouldn't have noticed anything like that because I wouldn't have suspected it. Well, come on, you can't have it both ways. So I think he steps into a bear trap here that she uses against him later. It's a resume statement. It is. It is. And later when he says, I would not notice it, he's discounting his resume, which is beautiful. Yeah. Mark? Yeah, so let's, let's just dig into that resume statement because I think it's really important for people to understand what he's talking about there. The National Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children. And he's saying, well, you, you have to remember. So he uses this a lot. He uses ideas like, well, it's funny 
or, um, you know, you need to understand or you have to remember. You have to remember. At that time, I was the patron of the NSPCC. So that he was the father of it. He's saying there is absolutely no way that I could ever be involved in anything like that because I've taken a patron uh, you know, position. And of course, we know that's not factual. And in fact, Britain has a, a, a history of people hiding in plain sight and using these institutions and, and founding them and certainly supporting them in order that they can look, uh, you know, clean. So as, as a public, we're not really buying it. It's a foolish move of his, and it doesn't make any sense. And I think because of all of those things, we know he's not connected with his audience at the moment. He has no help at the moment. I think, I think Greg, to your point, he's going back to coaching that he's had. He may be going back to um, uh, resistance to interrogation that he may have had as a, as a helicopter pilot. My guess is he would certainly have, have had that. He's keeping himself very tucked in, very still, but he's using some, he's making some classic errors of, of how not to perform uh, in this kind of situation. And I believe it's because he has no help at this point. He's on his own. He has no advice and he's not taking any advice. To, to your Whoa. point, Mark, resistance to interrogation has its place. And a person who knows what they're doing, and I won't point out what they're doing, certainly has some tools. I will say that the one thing he does very well throughout this thing is he is a master of stammering for effect. He, and it's his pattern. It's how he controls a conversation. He sets up the next sentence. Scott, you and I talked a little bit about this. You have some more insight on that piece, and I think you could add that in here. Yeah, so what's bugging me here is we're seeing him explain that he's the guy in charge, or he's one of the main guys that understands what this is, what it is when, when, when people are trafficking uh, children. And then he says he knows what these things are to look for. However, he doesn't see him. And I think as uh, trainers, we know what those things are, and we'd be able to point them out instantly as soon as we saw something like that. You have to remember that at the time, um, I was patron of the NSPCC's Full Stop campaign, so I was close up with what was going on in those um, uh, time about getting rid of abuse to, to children. So I knew what, was, what, the, what the things were to look for, but I never saw them. So you would have made that connection because you stayed with him, you were a visitor, a guest on many occasions at his homes, mm. and nothing, nothing struck you as suspicious? No. Nothing. During that whole time? Nothing. Anybody got anything else? Oh, good. Good. All right, let's, let's move. Just for the record, you've been on his private plane. Yes. You've been to stay on his private island. Yes. You've stayed at his home in Palm Beach. Yes. You visited Gillen Maxwell's house in Belgravia in London. Yes. All right. What do you got, Chase? So to, to Greg's point, one thing when we look at eye movement, uh, what I call, for just me personally, I call it home. Where is someone's home when we ask him a question of what happened a certain day? Their, his home is to our right, somewhere near the middle area. And when we ask somebody a geographical location, when we ask them to imagine visual things or geography, they typically look another direction. So we get another sense of that here when we ask him where it was and he was making sure. So his to his up and left is a little geographical area and maybe – all we're doing is just kind of collecting some data points here. But we see that completely accurate, instantaneous, yeah, yep, yep. And during those, there's some eye blocking going on. And we kind of close our eyes during some, we're recalling something emotional or recalling something that we really don't want to. But right at the end, when they're talking about the house in London, you see him say yes, followed by an immediate eye flutter behavior afterwards which I think shows that something happened there. And if I'm the interviewer, that's the moment that I push the shovel into the dirt. I'm going to start digging the moment that I see that eye flutter because there was one behavior, one behavior, one behavior, and then we see a flutter in response to the other one. Okay. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add something to that because 
I think there's something really important going on here with the third question there when he says yes to that. The, um, the first time, first question she asked him, he said, he closes his eyes two times and we've talked before about, uh, and Chase, you call it the, when the lens closes really quickly because you're waiting to look at something really quick. So sure. you're, you're, yeah, the shutter speed, your eyes, he's just relaxed. That first one, yeah, everything's cool. He's got two blinks there. The second question, four. All right, a little bit more. And on the third one, he only goes to two, but there's so much going on in that third thing. Something's up. Something has happened at that house. Something's going on there because here's what, here's what we see. When uh, she asked that, the first one, yes, his lips purse a little bit. He's like, ah, here we go. She's going to nail me for, for being at these places. That's understandable. And then when he gets to the third one, um, when she talks about the, the home in, uh, what is it, Palm Beach, the right side of his upper lip goes up a little bit, like in, in contempt or disdain or whatever. We see that go there, and his cheek as well. We see that, we'll get into micro expressions for a minute. We're not really doing that because these things are so big. So let's, but let's, let's dial down on some of this stuff. And um, I think something either bad happened there, something's not right there. It's the only place where when he answers these, his eyebrows go up. He looks for that. I don't know if he's looking for approval or, or what's going on there. Greg, you'll have to look, you have to, you have to see that again. But there's something going on there. It's the only time we see that the bottom parts of the whites of his eyes, his eyes open so wide, we can see those. That's the only time we see that. He's running something. Something in there has happened <clears throat> because we're seeing that that almost <clears throat> um, Pavlov's re Pavlov reaction to that, to that question when that word comes up. He's like, bang, something happens there very quickly. Uh, that He may be ready for that. I can't tell. But um, – it's the only time his eyebrows lift that high and it's, and it's his longest delay before he answers. All the other ones are just like the rhythm is right there. It's, he's loping. But when he hits that one, it, there's a, there's a slight, just a little longer of a pause before he, before he answers. So I would say something's up there. Either he had a bad experience there or he was afraid he was going to get busted there or some, something's up with that situation. I don't know what it is. Maybe we'll find out later on, but I would, I would try to remember that the, the, um, the Palm Beach house, because I think something's up there. I think something's up there. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so let's just look at the tonality of, of those yeses, because they're a good baseline. If we, if we take away everything that we're seeing, he goes, um, yes, yes, yes. All the tonalities are the same around that. A great baseline for us uh, to, to judge that he's telling the truth there. Very different from what we heard before was, yeah, yeah, yeah. Very different. Now, absolutely, we see on that third one, those eyes dart across and, and all of us there are going, well, there's summing up there. Well, uh, I think there are two things up. Number one is we're going to find out there's a photograph for a start. Okay, there's a picture taken in that place, but there's summing up as well because he already has his argument for that. He already has his argument for that, and he gave away his argument at the start, which is that I do remember. But other stuff, he just doesn't recall. He doesn't remember. And so I think that dart across is number one about, ah, uh, yeah, that's, that's the place with the photograph, and I've got my solution. I've got my way out of that one. I don't remember it. And then we're going to go into a whole bunch of stuff around the idea that if you can't prove that a photograph isn't fake, it could be. Yeah. Hey, Greg? <laughs> yes. For me, this one is preparation, right? This is a naval officer and royalty. He's prepared for this, that yes, yes, yes. These are facts. I think you are starting to see real fight or flight here. He does a mouth grooming move. If you notice this, where he pushes his tongue, there's a reason you're doing that. Protein builds up in your mouth from stress and mucous membranes start to decay fairly quickly without blood flow. And then things dry up and then a little bit of mucus comes in. And the next thing you know, you got this stringy garbage producing in your mouth and you self groom. I've seen that thousands of times. In sear, I would see protein build up in the corners of your mouth. You get white protein caked up in the corners of your mouth because of the level of stress. That's a really bad indicator that a person is in fight or flight that you'll probably never see in your life. But here you're seeing it in a 
very wealthy person who is under high stress from a different cause. That internal mouth groom, grooming is because he's dry in the mouth. He may not have protein breakdown yet, but he's certainly, or mucous membrane, but he's certainly feeling the, the effects of fight or flight, number one. I think the quick glance is because he's prepared very well to answer, yes, I did this, yes, I did this, yes, I did this. And I think to your guys' point, he has a plan for how he is going to unfold the story. And this is one of those moments I don't want to jump ahead that far. I think he has a plan. And so you see that movement. Otherwise, you guys have covered everything except respiration is ramping rapidly now. Fight or flight, you see the nostrils flaring, see the skin getting lighter. And the best part of this whole thing is he's aging as you watch him. His face is looking older by the minute. So that by the end of this, and guys, we're seven minutes in, and you're seeing his <laughs> eyes bagging, his face sagging. All of those things that you expect from a president who goes through this, but not in seven minutes. You're seeing a difference in his face. The stress is there. Right. Just for the record, you've been on his private plane. Yes. You've been to stay on his private island. Yes. You've stayed at his home in Palm Beach. Yes. You visited Gellin Maxwell's house in Belgravia in London. Yes. No, here we go. You're in London. Yes. So in 2006, in May, an arrest warrant was issued for Epstein for sexual assault of a minor. Yes. In July, he was invited to Windsor Castle to your daughter, Princess Beatrice's 18th birthday. Why would you do that? Because I was asking Galen. But even so, at the time, I don't think I... Um, certainly, I wasn't aware when the invitation was issued, what was going on in the United States. And I wasn't aware until, until the media picked up on it because he never said anything about it. All right, now this is the part where it's um, easy to say what his pulse rate is from looking at that, that foot sticking out there. You know, so Chase, why don't we start with you? So that artery is pushing the foot in little jerks and you can see it. This, luckily, we've got HD video of his feet. So if you, if I think, he, his foot was on camera for seven seconds. His foot went about eight or nine times, and I did nine divided by whatever times I saw it, and then multiply that by 60, and we got a pulse rate. So if we saw X number of things in 12 seconds, 12 divided by six or whatever is whatever, and then we'll multiply that by 60, and that'll give you the, the heart rate. But I, what we're seeing here is – we see more severity softening here and severity softening for, for you watching it's, this is so one of the most common things when we do an interrogation for somebody that's guilty, they don't want to say murder. They'll say hurt. They don't want to say steal. They'll say take, they don't want to say rape. They'll, they'll say have sex with. So we'll soften the severity of everything. And it's so, so deep here that he doesn't say when I found out about the sex ring. He just says when I found out about what was happening in America. So this is, this is a big deal to look for in the, in the next few videos. Okay. Greg, what do you got? Yeah. His blink race through the roof, watch his tie and you can see his pulse pounding. It's almost like a little signal there. You can see he's ramped up. He hits the uh-oh moment here for sure. You see him rolling his eyes. Uh, uh, yeah. And then he, he goes to his stammering defense words. He goes back to the idea, friend. It was my friend. It was Galen. It wasn't him. And, you know, I, I don't care who it was. If tomorrow, Scott, I found out that your best friend was a, was a child trafficker, I'd say, Scott, you're welcome your child trafficking friend can stay home, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. But it, he's got an excuse for this. If you watch him, you'll see that moment when he realizes that this is going to be a problem. He's poised for fight or flight. All this stuff starts to ramp up. He goes back to his defense words. He stumbles and he purse and he starts to purse his lips are the things I noticed. And it agreed with you a hundred percent that softening words that blame shit, people blame share. They go to softening words. They try to get away from the act. Right. Right. Okay. And I, I had a 90% oh. deception on that. Yeah. Okay. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I just want to mark out one thing to, to Greg's earlier point. 
uh, on the words arrest warrant from the interviewer, you get a push of the tongue inside the mouth here. So, you know, there's that moment there of you've now uh, been friends with somebody who definitely has an arrest warrant. So there is crime going on. You are uh, your friends with somebody who needs arresting for something criminal. My guess would be, in fact, my knowledge would be, is you don't get a warrant unless there's really good evidence. So the moment you've got an arrest warrant for a crime of that nature, it's pretty good, you know, pretty good that something went on, okay? And I want to add one more thing, which again is this authority idea, is that they both pronounce uh, Gelen, Gislen, differently, differently. And it's very marked out to say, you don't know how to pronounce my friend's name. You don't, you're not part of this group. This group is a little bit higher than you, and you don't know how to even use the right words. Somebody who didn't want uh, compliance and was looking for relationship would most likely just join in on the name being pronounced slightly wrong. You know, they, uh, from their point of view. He's very clear about letting the interviewer know that she keeps pronouncing in his mind his friend's name incorrectly. She's not part of the same society. Prince Andrew has spent his entire life in the spotlight, not least when he married Sarah Ferguson and when they separated six years later. The Duchess of York talked about feeling alone and, and not being prepared for royal life when she first married uh, you. Do you think lessons have been learned now that will make it easier in the future? I would like to think that lessons have been learned because, my goodness, <laughs> some lessons did need learning. Um, but um, memories sometimes can be quite short, so uh, a challenge. A challenge. I think, if anything, if if those sorts of those well, when when it happens again, which it, which it will do, uh, with William and Harry, um, then I suspect there will be a lot of people like their father and their uncle, making sure that their um, f not necessarily they're fully aware, but people around them are fully aware of the consequences of of getting it wrong. Despite the divorce, the Duke of York has maintained an extremely close relationship with his ex-wife. We're not getting engaged, okay? <laughs> so, uh, what do you think, Greg? Yeah, so a handful of things to look at in his baseline. This is a baseline with him being probed in his personal life again as well, so we get to see what's normal for him, nothing to lie about. But you can see that his focus is internal when he gets to the personal and he breaks eye contact and goes to an internal conversation. He's talking, but he's not really making eye contact as he navigates. He's not releasing everything. The other really good thing to watch here, this is 2010. He uses his brow a hell of a lot to talk. I do the same thing. And residuals occur when you use those muscles over and over and over. Unless you Botox them, you leave wrinkles. And you can see it in his forehead now. You, you, know, you can see his forehead constantly moving. And that brow beating thing he does is left behind that. We can't know what's going on in, in his head, but we can use this as a baseline to look forward to the future and know that it's a personal issue. So we've got a good start point here. Okay, excellent. What do you guys think? Mark? Yeah, so I, I would agree. And I think it's probably a good baseline on how he performs when he is holding back some elements of information. Because if we look at his speech patterns, he's not being, you know, verbally you know, fully expressive, I would say. He's clearly holding back information uh, or couching information. And so I would take it as a good baseline for him and when he's couching information there. Also, the other baseline I take from this is um, he says a challenge, a challenge. And that would feel to me like he's suggesting he's stopped talking, he's done. But if you shut up, he just keeps on going. So one of the things as an interviewer is to never take those, uh, you know, reiterations as a signal to go for a new question. If you shut up as the interviewer, he'll just keep on spilling the beans. 
Uh, does does that make sense in America? Yeah. Selling the beans? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. What do you think, Chase? That's absolutely true. And there's another technique while you're interviewing. If someone does the challenge thing, you just repeat a couple of the last words that they said. The verbal reflection or verbal mirroring as they teach at the FBI, that really gets it out of them. And you can see this this happens a couple of times in the interview. And we see a, another baseline for this lip licking hygienic gesture. And you even see it at the very beginning of this clip, at, right before he kisses his wife uh, at their wedding even. And we saw a couple of more things, the, the face wrinkles that Greg talks about. We call that, in my training, I call that uh, expression etching. So it just etches over time. But we also see he makes eye contact the same way a lot of charismatic people do, which is 50% of the time while we're speaking and 70% of the time while we're listening. So he does that a lot. If you go watch Bill, Bill Clinton on Conan O'Brien get interviewed about his first job he ever had, you'll see him look down at the ground and smile while he's recollecting the memory. But we, we have a good baseline here. So we see some of the behaviors that might look stressful in a different scenario now we understand are, are different. Excellent. And what I'm seeing is I'm always talking about loping and it's how when you tell a story, you start talking, you just loping along. That's what we're seeing here. We're seeing a baseline of him just loping along and we don't see that at all in this, in this interview. It's nowhere to be found in there. I've been looking for it. It's one of my favorite things to, uh, to judge things from once you get a baseline on, on, on their loping at what they sound like or, and look like nothing in there after he starts uh, this interview. So for me, and his attitude, of course, is a lot different as well. You know, he's not all, he's not all stressed, but that's, but he's, and we see him relaxed. Not that he shouldn't be relaxed in this, uh, you know, that he, not that he should be relaxed in this other interview because he's being, you know, he's, he's, he's everything's on the line there. But well, well, she's more of an interrogator than this lady was. What too. a great job she does. Yes. I keep, I know I keep saying, mm -hmm. but my goodness, in these examples we're going to see, we're going to see an example of what she, or we get the pizza part where she asks him a question. He talks about it and then she dang turns around and asks it again. She does it almost every, not every question, but she's, oops, she's so good at that. So good at it. So let's, let's get started with question one. Virginia Roberts yeah. has made allegations against you. She says she met you in 2001. She says she dined with you, danced with you at Tramp Nightclub in London. She went on to have sex with you in a house in Belgravia belonging to Gerlen Maxwell, your friend. Your response? I have no recollection of ever meeting this lady. None whatsoever. You don't remember meeting her? No. So, uh, Chase, are you going to say something before we, st before we watch that? What are you going to say about that uh, video we, just, we watched beforehand? Right at the beginning of the interview, if, if you've heard of micro expressions before, it's basically just a tiny, quick facial expression. And there is a beautiful example there. It's a, it's a wonderful, teachable moment for anybody that's watching. Right as she says, when you guys got married, or words to that effect, you can see the sneer on the left side of her face where she shows contempt for the prince in that moment. You can see the side of her face tighten up. So when you see like a one-sided smile, that's what a contempt facial expression look like. And it's the only facial expression that is asymmetrical. Excellent. Okay. So let's talk about what we're seeing in this, in this uh, first when she questions him here about Virginia Roberts. Uh, Mark, what are you seeing? Yeah, so I actually want to go to uh, his strategy here because he foreshadowed this strategy as we talked about in our first episode together when he said, that's the bit that I remember, suggesting that there will in the future be elements that he does not remember. And so I would suggest here he's now on his rehearsed pace. He's already strategized. I'm going to say, I don't remember this. I don't recall that. And so I think that's what we're seeing playing out here is a strategy. What I'm interested in is what can we detect underneath that? Because this is rehearsed for him. This is his moment. So I'm wondering from everybody else, how's he doing? Greg, you want that one? Yeah, not so well. So <laughs> number one, he's got that problem of steepling and his hands are in his lap, so he can't go any further down to show that he has been compromised. So he starts to mill his hands and do some wonky thing with his hands. That's energy trying to escape the body. I want to get my rear end out of this chair and out that door, but I can't, so I'm going to try to find a place to go. 
right in through here, and it could, it's harder to see in this, but pay very close attention to his pupils. They don't just dilate, they pinpoint again. That is stress. When you, your eyes start moving, when your actual pupils start to move, that's a really good indicator of stress levels. The last one that I really am paying attention to, not only does he drop his jaw to cover his throat, but his jaw recesses and his upper lip drops. I almost think he looks like he wants to cry for a split second there, that little micro expression. Looks like a little boy. He does. He looks like he's on the carpet. Mom has gotten him for doing something in his. Yeah. yeah. He's not doing right, so Chase. Well. <laughs> What do you got, Chase? Yeah, so that, that pupil dilation, this is a rare thing to see in these video interviews because this camera is super high def, the, the angle's really great, and pupil dilation is something you look for only when there's a, a steady lighting conditions. If the lighting conditions are changing, that's obviously probably due to the lights. So this is a perfect setup. So if you go back and watch this clip, you can see the pupils start changing in size. Another thing you can see from over his shoulder is his breathing rate starting to increase. You can see that shoulder going up and down. And another one, just for this small clip, you can also get his pulse by looking at his legs towards the end. And I think back to what Mark said about this thing, whole thing being rehearsed, that's the reason we're seeing him nod and say, yep, yep, yep. He's just... He's saying, I've done that. Yep, I've prepared for this. I've prepared for this. He's nodding in anticipation of the next step of his plan. Right. Yeah. And so I want to jump in here and just add and reiterate on this. This isn't stress because he wasn't expecting this question. Right. This isn't stress because he's going, what am I going to say here? He's got it planned. This is stress about something else. That's so, what's important. Scott, here's a place to talk about the thing. This guy, if you think he's stupid, you're stupid because this guy is brilliant. This is methodical, and he has a process-driven approach. And, Scott, I know you, you can talk more to this. I call it chaff and redirect. Yeah. As I'm going to leave so much stuff behind me that you'll chomp at one of those, and the minute you do, I'll take you there. And he is yeah. massive. Conversation. Yeah, he's great. He's a great storyteller. That's what makes it so good. He's seen a lot of stuff. He's got a lot of history behind him. He's heard people tell stories. He's got to learn the stories of the history of, of the royal family. He's got to know all that stuff. So he's been hanging around people who tell stories great. And he's become a great storyteller. Now, there's a guy named uh, Yuri Hassan, and he's at, uh, I think it's Purdue. And he's the guy that did the studies on the brain and storytelling. And what he found was brains will, your brain will sync or connect with someone else's brain and hang on as you tell him a story. It happens very quickly. I won't get into the details of the studies he did, but they're fascinating. Yuri Hassan, I believe it's Purdue. So if you want to learn about that, uh, if there's somebody watching ones over about that, that's a great, it's a great thing to check out. So that's what he's doing here. That's why these things, as we know, why stories are good in marketing, they're good in all kinds of things. That's why he start, he puts these almost in story form. As you go along, you'll see him so he can hop from one thing to the other. And like Trump, when Trump as as uh, Greg's pointed out before, when Trump says something and he wants to, that's it. I've said it. There it is. He goes, gets that tag. He's tagging, but well, it's not tagging. But he's marking his, those spots where he's completed something, like Mark was saying, uh, by by saying, mm-hmm, or okay, or whatever, whatever the words were he was saying. That's exactly what he's doing there. And to Chase's point, uh, when we're talking about uh, micro expressions, we're talking about the dilation. The dilation. When she he gets to the part, and he, she says, um, talks about Virginia and having the, um, the th when she says against you, when she says you, that's when that, that's when those, um, they get small and they start getting bigger. His, his um, pupils, you can see them get small and then start getting bigger. That's when the big one hits. Against you. She says she met you against you. She says she met you against you. She says she met you. Against and then at the same time, if you'll notice that I'll show, show this when we go back. He's got a lot of nostril flare. It's really small, really small. If we're going to talk about micro expressions, let's get up in its hind and talk about the micro parts. Very small, but I'll show where that happens as well. It's the same thing. Epstein's accusers, Virginia Roberts, yep. has made Epstein's accusers, Virginia Roberts, yep. has made Epstein's accusers, Virginia Roberts, yep. has made. On the larger side, when he when he starts, um, he does what 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 I refer to as fading facts. As he's talking, if you ask him a question, somebody a question, do you light the car on fire that caught the house on fire that killed the kid in the house? And they say, well, I wasn't there. I don't know what you're talking about. It usually that time David go, 
to the park. Or whatever. And as the more they talk, the less, the quieter it gets. He's shown he's unsure about this answer, and I believe he knows something's up. There's somewhere, there's some more information about this girl and him that's going to pop up later. Somewhere, I don't know what, but he knows that that's what, but he's still taking that chance. He can't say, here's what I know, here's what I did, you know. So we're seeing those fading facts as he's, he's, he's lying, but he's pretending he's telling the truth, but, he's, but you see it get quieter as he goes along as he tries to distance himself from that lie. So, all right, anybody else? Hey, one, one thing I will add, the last thing, the pupil dilation and pinpoint, when I worked SEER, that was mm-hmm. the only place it was common. You don't see that very much in people because if they're shocked, often their pupils may dilate but, and then go back to pinpoint. But really, the pinpoint and opening, that's a rare thing to see, not just Chase in an interview with a camera, but in people in general. You just don't see it often. It's true. Chase pointed that out yesterday when we were talking about that. When when he gets to the part where he says Virginia, he's like blank. But then when he gets to you, they boom, then start getting zeroing in. It's it's. I'll show it up close because it's fascinating what's going on in here. In that head is. Chase, you had you had the tag on the name, and I think we should talk about that. But that to me, it's weird to watch them move because you just don't see it that often. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. All right, here we go. I'm just trying to work this out because you said you went to break up the relationship and yet you stayed at that New York mansion several days. I'm wondering how long... But I was doing a number of other things while I was there. But you were staying at the house of a convicted sex offender. It was a convenient place to stay. I mean, mean, I've gone through this in my mind so many times. At the end of the day, um, uh, uh, with the benefit of all the hindsight that one could have... Um, it was definitely the wrong thing to do, um, but at the time I felt it was the, it was the honourable and right thing to do, and I, I admit fully that that, that that my judgment was probably coloured by my um, tendency to be too honourable, but that's just the way it is. All right, Greg, you want to go first? Yeah, guys, and hopefully I don't steal anybody's thunder, but this is my single favorite moment of the entire video because he is frail here. This is the most frail you'll see him throughout the entire interview. He, this is a mea culpa if there is one anywhere. Hey, I did something stupid, and if you just said that, it probably would have come across just fine. But instead, definitely the wrong thing. His body language is showing that. We talk about eye movement a lot, but one of the things to note is that when people get emotional, their big heavy lunk of a head drifts down into the right. And you'll see he is kind of balled up, but he is gesturing and, and, and illustrating what he's thinking. His head is down to the right, his eyes are down to an internal conversation. And then his brow is down as concentration. He is looking over for some, for some approval. And his eyes are not, his eyelids at this point are not fluttering. I, I'll use your term, Chase, and, 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 and follow it. His shutter speed, his processor is running. It's not eyelid flutter. It's processor. And then he looks up at her and requests approval as he tries to salvage some dignity. This is a two-step process. He's saying, hey, here's this horrible thing I did. It was dumb. He's working through the mechanics of it and trying to find at least a scrap of dignity in the background and saying, I guess I was too honorable. I think it's trying to re- recover some of what he should be. It's the most frail moment in the entire video to me. What do you think, Chase? I completely agree with Greg. And this is, this is a great humble brag, but I think it's also going into the narrative. It's going into his narrative, and we see a shoulder shrug the moment that he says it. And we, we see when he's trying to gain a little bit of approval, we see the eyebrow flash and a head tilt, we expose our necks to people when we want to be trusting, when we're curious about something and protecting us from big cats was our original reason we had to raise our shoulders. And that was from old Joe Navarro. And that whole, that whole time throughout the interview, you, every time he gets a question, he knows he's prepared for, or he knows that it's going to be tough. You see the large upper chest inhale before he answers every time. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so I want to hit on one thing here, which is one of the ways he tries to get compliance here and move this away. So we know that this is a hot spot for him because he wants to move on. And he says, I've been through this in my own head so many times. 
So what he's suggesting is, is I've already thought about this. Can we just move on? Because I've already thought about this. I've done the processing. We don't need to talk about this in the open. I've thought about it. And then from there, because that doesn't succeed, because the interviewer doesn't go, oh, okay, yeah, I'm sorry. You've already thought about this. What haven't you thought about? What would you like to talk about? That doesn't happen. <laughs> She's silent. It has to move on. And so that's why he has to go there into, you know, I think that's a great idea there, Chase, the humble brag or the virtue signaling. Yes. And it's a big yeah. signal to say I'm yeah. just, uh, you know, too honorable, too honorable. Yeah. That's yeah. extraordinary. That's his ego because as he's going through there, and I think he's thought about that before. We can we can stick that in, and that's that ego coming out because what he's trying to do when he comes out of there, as he tell as he's talking, he's open. He's say, but you'll notice when he first throws his illustrators when he when he's open, you'll see that foot come up as the barrier. It goes down fairly quickly, but still, it's up guarding as he's being as he's supposedly being open. So, and I think that's what that is. This is ego getting out of hand. It sort of gives you um, an idea about what kind of person you're dealing with there. Well, well, again, we're, we're dealing here, Scott, with somebody who doesn't have any advisors around them right now, because a decent advisor would have heard that from him and gone, you know, you actually, uh, your Royal Highness, you're not going to say that. Uh, here's exactly what you're going to say. Mm -hmm. You are going to take responsibility for an element of this and, and therefore deflect from the element which you're not going to take responsibility right. for but you are going to take responsibility. And Chase has talked about this a number of times, which is building somebody a bridge to get out of this situation. Yeah. Now this interviewer, I don't think is building many bridges and that's what's great about it, but it's not that you can't build your own bridge out of this, but he's not taking the advice on that. And so that's why we're going to see this become a disaster for him uh, ultimately, in that, you know, not to to um, spoil the plot of this, but he ends up essentially resigning the next day due to all of this. And one thing you notice when he says, I've thought a lot about this, if you go back and listen, he says he only thought about it after it became public. Right. He says as soon as, well, after everybody knew about it. Exactly what he says, right? That's a, I don't know if we covered that one, but that's one of the best lines in the entire thing. I thought so too. I wanted to make sure we... We at least put a little thumbtack in that one. I'm just trying to work this out because you said you went to break up the relationship and yet you stayed at that New York mansion several days. I'm wondering how yeah, long... But I was doing a number of other things while I was there. But you were staying at the house of yes. a convicted sex offender. It was a convenient place to stay. There was, I, mean, I mean, I've gone through this in my mind so many times. At the end of the day... Um, uh, uh, with the benefit of all the hindsight that one could have, um, it was definitely the wrong thing to do. Um, but at the time, I felt it was the, it was the honourable and right thing to do. And I, I admit fully that, 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 that my judgement was probably coloured by my um, tendency to be too honourable, but that's just the way it is. All right, everybody good? Yeah. Okay, so let's move along. Uh, another guest was John Brockman, uh, the literary agent. Now, he described really? seeing you there getting a foot massage from a young Russian woman. Did that happen? No. You're absolutely sure or yeah, you can't remember? I'm absolutely sure. So John Brockman's statement is false? Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I don't know Mr. Brockman, so I don't know what he's talking about. But that definitely wasn't you getting a foot massage from a Russian girl in Jeffrey Epstein's house. Mm, no. It... <laughs> All right. Yeah. So now it doesn't sound like, a, you know, you think foot massage, what a big deal. But when you see, I watched the first episode of this Epstein thing. Greg and I both, both watched it. When you see that first episode, you'll realize why that's an important part here. Why that's a, that's a key to what's, to what's happening in that house. You know, and some other things that I, I see going on along, you know, of course, you've got that head tuck, but when you see his, when you pay attention to his blink rate, and I don't want to step on you, Chase, because I know a lot of times we'll, everybody covers the same things. We try to stay out of each other's way. So if I'm not stepping on your blink rate thing, not at all. It's, it's, it plummets. I think he blinks three times during this whole thing because he's making sure 
she's believing him. So if he has to add any qualifiers and, and uh, then you start looking at, um, he never says no. When she asks him, she says, so Brockman, in other words, so Brockman's lying. He never says no. He, he starts, he starts talking, but he never says no, which is of course one of the biggies from that. And his movement compared overall and this thing, he's almost like a statue compared to the way he is in the, in the rest of the um, interview. He doesn't move hardly at all. He does some, but not, not much at all. So I think that's important as well because he's taken in all that information. The only thing I didn't see in there was his eyes get really big, which I kept, ex- I kept expecting that. As you'll see when somebody, you get him, he's got the head turned as it's going, but he doesn't, the eyes don't get really big, you know. But all this after that big fake surprise he throws on. Right. Well, I think that's his big eye movement, right? He's it must be. Surprise. Yeah, yeah. That's so. Keep going, Greg. What do you got? Yeah, yeah. For me, this is the classic overreaction, right? If you don't know someone at all, and I mention them, you don't go, "Oh, he was there." I don't know this guy, but I'm reacting that way. Well, something caused you to cue. That's one of the biggest overreactions in the entire video. Is that crazy? Shock with the eye thing, puts his head forward, leans it down. His pupils actually close in this one, Chase. I'm sure you've noticed better than I did, but his pupils actually close very, very tightly in here. His eyes are all in. He's got a conspicuous retreat. And then he makes eye contact solidly when he goes to the no. And it's one of the emphatic no's in this entire thing. I think there are about three that are emphatic denials, and this is one. Because this, I think you're hitting it dead on, Scott, because this is the gateway when you watch what Epstein did, his creepy factor starts this way. So that's, mm. I think what you're yes. saying. Chase, what do you got? I think the surprise was genuine. And I think it might be in reaction to, oh crap, that guy said something. Or maybe. I didn't know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you can see if we go back, you can see the sclera, the, the white part of our eyeballs above and below the iris, the little colored circle. Which, which is kind of hard to fake, especially if you're under a lot of stress. And we see, if, if anybody watching this, if I accused you of doing something that you didn't do, you'd say that statement's absolutely false. We, none of us would have a problem calling someone else a liar if it was false. And then again, if I have guilty knowledge about something, then a foot massage sounds really dirty. But if it's just a foot massage and I don't feel guilty about anything else, I, what's the harm in saying, yeah, that was me. I was getting a foot massage. Yeah. And you'll see, like, again, you'll see the importance of that in that, in that uh, Netflix thing in the uh, Epstein. So what do you got, Mark? Yeah, so I think he's, he's performing over the surprise in order to try to create another narrative there, which is curiosity. I think exactly as we've said so far, he's genuinely surprised by that, either because it's, hey, I didn't think that guy would say anything, or what you've got a witness. And 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 my the the thing I want to get across to you, you know, listening to this is if you're gonna lie, you've got to make sure there isn't any evidence out there because the evidence is going to show up at some point. Lying is for the lazy. Lying is for the people who don't want to take the punishment right now for what they've done, okay? Because the evidence is showing up later, maybe in your life, maybe in somebody else's lifetime, but it's showing up, it's coming out. Unfortunately, here, there is an eyewitness who is, is, is alive now and has, has talked. So uh, now what's his way out of this? Uh, it's incredible. It's, it's, well, I don't know him. The idea that if I don't know somebody, it means they could be a liar. That's his logic. And if we unpack that logic, we see that it's, it's, it's risible. It's laughable. That's not accurate, that if you don't know somebody, it means they're probably a liar. So I think we know he's, um, he's, he's fried now this is now going one way and it's all downhill from here for him he's not in control of this anymore. i agree and i think i and i think what that big fake what was he's trying to catch his surprise at that point because 
which shows you he's probably, I don't know if this guy angers easily or not. I would bet from seeing that he probably does. Because I think it got away from him and he was trying to catch it going, what? Instead of, instead of being showing his anger, he showed that. He does it twice. He does it twice in this interview, that same exact eye movement thing. Later yeah. when they're talking about Florida, I believe, is when he does it again. Is that the one where he's talking? Oh, I should, I should I'll find it. But it's one where he's talking about, uh, he goes, well, I was, there was a dinner and I was there. That part, there's well, a that party. Narky and sarcastic. Well, oh man, it was so I awesome. Love that one. That's you, know what, you know what that reminds me of is Judge Smales from Caddyshack. <laughs> <laughs> I hand to oh, hand to waiting. God, I was thinking as I was good. I thought I'll drop that in there for when we did when we did it because yeah, it's, it's, I thought that'd be too yeah. cornball. I'll play. You don't want that scholarship, do you? I guess I don't. I guess you don't. I guess you don't. Yeah. And you know, uh, one one quick teachable moment we can we can share with our viewers here is at this point, if you're ever asking somebody questions and they don't know how much data you have, this is when we would do something called a punishment question or a bait question. Yep. A bait question specifically starts with the words just real quick and easy. Is there any reason? And that's all you have to say. So we're not going to say I have a bunch of evidence. We're not going to say anything, but is there any reason that somebody would have come forward just yesterday and said that they saw you do X, Y, and Z? And one quick tip with the bait questions is we raise the stakes in the beginning. So we say, listen, John, I really like you. And I just want you to think very hard before you answer this question. And then towards the end, we want to be a little bit vague because if I say is there any reason someone saw you do this at 9.02 PM and you did it at nine, then you could say, no, nope, there's no way. Well, here, you know, a little here's bit a thing. good, another great opportunity to teach something you just said, right? There's a thing called, we know all. And I, you know, I may have a file full of garbage and I can say, eh, I know that you did something. The minute I nail down a fact that isn't true, we go from, we know all that we don't know anything. Right. And that's the point. The more finite you are with your bluff, the more danger you're in. Yeah. And another one, what I think is hilarious is when you add too much information, too many small things, it's like, geez, I don't know. For example, if you were to say, would there be any reason whatsoever? Yeah. That little pause for your DNA to be, in the, you know what I'm talking about? Hair, yeah. eyelashes, skin cells. Maybe you spit and you call all these things you'd never find, but you throw all these things out there. They're thinking, and you can see them running that scenario in their, in their head as well as you keep going down that road. And you're just throwing out the bait, the bait question. Oh, it's one of my favorites. That's why I like to read techniques so much. I know I talk about that a lot, but it's like a dang, it's like a muscle car. You know, yeah, you can put all what tires you want, flames on the side, oh, paint it whatever color you want. Not recognizable from two people at, at one point because you get so good at your own version. I think yeah, that's, 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 that's what the key. The four of us work well together is our body language versions are so different because we come at it from different angles. It's what makes this whole interrogation and lie detecting and body language thing a great second career yeah yeah all right everybody good yeah did, did you worry that he had something that could compromise you no no do you regret that trip yes it happened she provided a photo of yes. the two of you together yes your arm was around her waist yes you've seen the photo i've seen the photograph how do you explain that uh, you want to go first mark yeah, so it, we could also baseline that with um, some of the yeses that he gave earlier around places that he'd been as well. And we talked about those in the in the first episode. And it, let's just look at it simply. Let's just say you've got upward intonation and downward intonation. I mean, it's a little more complex than that, but let's make it really simple. You know, there's the rising tone, yeah, which, which often can signal, signal an idea of there's something coming next or that's a question, not a statement. There's another, a, another bunch of things as well, but let's keep it relatively simple. So, so his, his uh, no's or yeses will tend to illustrate that there is probably something else there and it is not emphatic. An emphatic no will be no. An emphatic yes will be yes. In fact, uh, loud and downward intonation we tend to call command tonality, which I'm doing for you right now. And questioning tonality will be up like this and suggests there's something coming next, which is why it kind of keeps you on this kind of hiatus. 
and, and gets quite annoying after a while if I carry on making statements but having and that watch upward his forehead while he's doing that I love it <laughs> yeah yeah so so let me leave it at, at, at that because I just think it's 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 a good teachable element to just see tonality in simple forms of there's up or there's down and down could be seen as more decisive and up could be seen as there's something more to come or I don't quite know excellent Chase what do you got if you're about to get hit and you know someone's about to hit you, you're going to turn your head and look at them. And with everything here, if, if we know somebody who turns out to be a disgusting human being like Epstein, you're, we'll be comfortable saying it. We'll be comfortable saying the act. We'll be comfortable saying the person's name. We'll be comfortable saying it's disgusting. I hate it. I denounce all of those things, which never happens once in this video. And it culminates with what I think here is one of the key factors that, that runs this whole thing. When she says, are you worried he had something that he could use to ruin your reputation? His whole body's frozen. There's a tiny no. And maybe the, the verbal stuff isn't there, but the rest of the evidence throughout the entire conversation really does spell out that if I'm worried that there's a video that might get leaked somewhere, I will definitely not, I'm not going to talk about that person in a negative light ever. And I can't, I can never, I can never denounce what they do, what they did. And I'm going to use their name as little as possible in the interview, bring as little attention to the person who has a gun pointed at my head as possible. Excellent. Greg, what do you got? Yeah. So this one's really easy for me. Everything else aside, all that's great and all that is true. And that's the compounding. But no one who is not concerned does this. Were you concerned? No. I mean, look at his brow. Look how knit and tight and squared down it is. Imagine somebody looking at you and singing happy birthday like this. What would you think? He's communicating stress and concern with his brow and it is knitted and knotted. And that's good enough for me that if I didn't have any sound, I would know something is wrong right there. Excellent. Did, did you worry that he had something that could compromise you? No. No. Do you regret that trip? Yes. It happened. She provided a photo of yes. the two of you together. Yes. Your arm was around her waist. Yes. You've seen the photo. I've seen the photograph. How do you explain that? Excellent. I've got nothing to add to that um, except for his... his it's just really quiet because, you know, it suggests we're seeing deception, I think. All right, here we go. Do you remember dancing at Tramp? No. That couldn't have happened because the date that is being suggested, I was at home with the children. Mark, you go ahead. Uh, well, let's go back to that tonality. Let's just say that if I'm giving an emphatic no, do you remember dancing at Tramp? No. Yeah, it's like, no. So that elongation of it. Now, I think the elongation is because he's ramping up to his strategy. And this is, he's already got this sorted out. It's not possible to dance at Tramp because you're having pizza at Pizza Express with your kids. So it's just, he's, he's, he's moving into strategy here. That's why there's that funny tonality. All right, Chase, where you got? This is where the interviewer asked him, do you remember instead of did it happen? And that is, you're giving them a permission slip to just say yes or no. And what we'd like to say, we know that this whole thing is going to play off memory. So we're going to say, why would she say this? Or what happened that evening? Tell me about this entire day. Where were you? And did you do it? And this is also an argument or a denial from recollection. It's not a denial. It's a denial of recollection. So keep in mind, he's not denying that it happened. He's just saying the date might be wrong at this point. Okay. Greg? Yeah, for me, he's, he's on his plan we talked about yesterday or in the, the earlier version. He's on his plan. He knows what he's going to say here. So he's just prepped. Nope. Nope. It's just a kind of a flippant. No, I don't hear, I don't see anything dramatic. All I see is him ready for battle. He knows that he's already prepared. Hey, I was with my kids. Yeah. 
I, I, here again, I, I'm just seeing fading facts. I mean, that's the big one that sticks out for me. As he's talking, it just gets quieter as he goes along, goes up, which is another sign of deception. Do you remember dancing at Tramp? No. That couldn't have happened because the date that is being suggested, I was at home with the children. So, all right, everybody good? Good. Right. You know that you were at home with the children. Mm. Was it a memorable night? On that particular day that, that, that um, uh, we now understand is the date, which is the 10th of March, uh, I was at home. Uh, I was with the children. I'd taken Beatrice to uh, a Pizza Express in Woking for a party at, a, I suppose, sort of four or five in the afternoon. Um, and then because the Duchess was away, we have a simple rule in the, in the, in the family that, 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 that when one's away, the other one's there. I was on terminal leave at the time um, from the, the Royal Navy, so therefore I was at home. All right. Uh, Chase, you want to go first? Sure. This is what I, I call an over answer. So someone makes a denial and says, no, I, I didn't drive to that convenience store and rob it. I actually, I drive a Ford Explorer. It's, a, it's about a year old, it's black, and just got it vacuumed out a few weeks ago, and I also park it in reverse in my driveway. So no, couldn't have happened. So we're, we're just adding unnecessary detail to something to help, help the answer sound more credible and more full of information for the person listening. Right. I, I totally agree with you because what he's doing is building that picture like you got to take out of your head and give it to somebody else. And you're act, so they're on the impression you actually see all this stuff happening <clears throat> as they build, as they add these qualifiers to what's going on. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, exactly, guys. That is an inject. That is information he's packaged. He's prepared. If you notice, his baseline is pretty human. It's normal. He's rhythmic. He's telling a story. And all of those details are there to support and there's a word that people don't commonly use to close out a, a, a story, therefore. That's his proposal as to why he couldn't have done it. No yeah, because he mean, wants your brain to go on and fill all that in. That's right. He, that's, a, that's a summation. That's, that's Alan Dershowitz talking, not him, right? That's the way people talk when they're presenting their case. Yeah. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so uh, virtue signaling there, you know, I'm a hands-on dad. That's, this is the, the arrangement that we have uh, with the Duchess. So, so that would be his ex-wife, the kid's mother. But, you know, most people would probably go, so I've got the, this arrangement with the kid's mother, you know, if they're divorced or, or they're on actually quite good terms. So he's more likely to say, you know, Sarah and I have an arrangement. He calls her the Duchess and then goes on to say terminal leave from the Royal Navy. Okay, so we know you're a vice admiral. We, we understand that. You maybe don't need to tell us the name of the institution that you are in service and the vice admiral of. So for me, it's, uh, you know, as we've talked about before, and I think, you know, uh, maybe Chase coined this, this term, is, is, is reading out the resume. It's, it's, it's signaling that resume, and, and, and that's quite a hot signal of potentially overcompensation for something. Now, let me ask you guys something. We've all been young men before. When you went out, what time did you start going to the clubs? What time did you start going out when you were looking for chicks, man? What, when were you going out? About what time was that? 9.15. Yeah. yeah. Wait, at least. Yeah. At least. I mean, in London, 11. in London, it's, it's, you know, you've got to go out after the pubs shut anyway, because you don't want to get caught up in the 10, 30, 11 melee. Uh, mm -hmm. tr uh, Tramp goes till well late. I mean, it, it's yeah. renowned for going later than anything else. So, so at their you know, house, get in. at the prince's house, he's not by himself. He's going to have somebody there to watch the kids. He's going to oh, go, sure. I'm going to step out for a little bit. I'll be right back. I'm going to go out and see what's going on at so-and-so's house, whatever his excuse is going to be. She's out of town, and this guy's out. You know, he's out. Go he's going to he's clubbing at that point. You know, so he says at 4 or 5 o'clock or whatever. No, nobody's going to go out at 4 or 5 o'clock. Those right. people aren't even up yet. You know, at, at that I point. I have omission. I have omission. Yeah. 
Right? There's yeah. a big and then, right? What did you yeah. do? Well, I went back from, I guarantee if you, if you nailed him down, well, we left the Pizza Express and then went home and went to bed. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. Four, four or five is not, is not the time when you go to Tramp. Tramp is next to Fortnum and Mason. They do high tea. So if you're looking for high tea, uh, Fortnum and Mason will do it for you. There's no dancing there. You have to go next door to Tramp at, you know, midnight onwards <laughs> for <laughs> good catch dancing. Great right, catch. Yeah. Yeah. And also you see him, you, you've seen the self soothing things. You see him try to calm himself down with his hands. It's not huge, but if you watch it, it goes from very light to getting just a little bit more as he starts, as he starts rubbing his thumb there. What do you got on that chase? Anything? Yeah. So that's this with the self soothing behavior, aside from what I already said, our, our good friend, Joe Navarro has one of my favorite phrases and it's small enough to fit on a bumper sticker, but it was profound when I heard it. And he said, any repetitive behavior is self soothing. And that's all you need to know. I, and I always call that you're making familiar the unfamiliar. When you're in a bad place and you want to make yourself comfortable, everybody does something. Tug your ear, play with your hair, pick your nails. Whatever it is, it makes you comfortable. Pacing. And that's all there is yeah. to it. All right. Thanks. Here we go. Why would you remember that so specifically? Why would you remember a, a Pizza Express birthday and being at home? Because... Going to Pizza Express in Woking is an unusual thing for me to do. A very unusual thing for me to do. I've never been, I've only been to Woking a couple of times um, and I remember it weirdly distinctly. But as soon as somebody reminded me of it, I went, oh yes, I remember that. But so I have no recollection of ever meeting or, or being in the company or the presence. Okay, Mark, that's yours. What do you think? Yeah. So going to Pizza Express is a weird thing to do. That's condescending because he's uh, Pizza Express in the UK uh, is a is a quite a nice place for fairly ordinary people to go to. So what he's doing there is trying to get a uh, a laugh of recognition out of the interviewer to say uh, somebody like me would never go to Pizza Express, so it's very, very rare. But the smile we see from him doesn't have the narrowing of the eyes and doesn't have, therefore, these darker areas appear there. So he's trying to get compliance. He doesn't truly mean the smile, which is why he doesn't get a laugh back or a nod of, of, of recon recognition, because it is true. It is a weird place for His Royal Highness to show up at Pizza Express. If I was at Pizza Express and, you know, suddenly, you know, Prince Charles sat down next to me, I would be like, well, this is very, very notable and odd. So, yes, it is odd. He's trying to get compliance from the interviewer and a laugh out of her. But what gives it away is it's not a true Duchenne smile. It's not true pleasure. It's one of those slightly forced, come on, laugh along with me, join in, smiles. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I, I'd take it a step further. I'd say it's a contained, controlled, kind of a snarky smile and almost a criticism of, of the whole thing, right? Look, I'm, I'm low-classing myself. I'm, I'm debasing myself by going there, and we all know it, exactly like you said, Mark. But then there's that contained and curving down, controlling the smile, almost like he's self-amused. So, yeah, I think that's why she doesn't respond is because he looks self-amused. Chase? Yeah, I think that smile was – I'm pretty damn pleased with myself right now. Yeah. And, and yeah. you could be too, if, and you could join me. But here's the one thing that I got out of this that I think it's easy to miss. And I think this is the one thing that pulls everything together. If the reason he doesn't remember is because it didn't happen, then he'd be comfortable saying it didn't happen. And here's why. If he remembers every detail of going to the pizza place because it was an unusual event. So let's go back. I remember the pizza place because it was unusual. If he remembers unusual events with great clarity, meeting this woman and dancing with her and then later having sex with her would be an unusual event. So either A, he makes a firm denial, that, that's unusual, I would remember it, it never happened, ever. 
or B, that's just not a, that's just a usual event. Doing things like that becomes something that's usual. So here's, here's a place where I, I may have a different opinion on this one. This is a good opportunity for us. I think he is, has a prepared denial. And the reason he comes back at the end with the statement, I remembered that, but I don't remember her. I think it's part of his strategy and his prepared statement, Chase. And I would say either is possible because we can't, the, the cool thing about what we do is we can't see inside their heads, right? But what we can do is see the symptoms. It's one or the other. I feel like he's got a strategy and he's trying to grasp at it and hold on and go back and, and repeat this. I, I, think I completely he, agree. Every one of those things and he's just denying them. Right. So, I mean, either A, you make 100% denial or B, you don't remember it because it's something you do all the time. Yeah. And, and that's a possibility. That's honest. Right. So this points to me around being a good liar. You know, for anybody out there, oh, he's I a pro. Teach you how to be a good liar. But if you're going to be a good liar, not only do you need to sort out your details, but you must sort out your internal logic. Your internal logic must be foolproof around this because anybody with a, with a decent questioning power will just undo the logic and then the story is going gonna, is, is gonna to fall apart. In but, front of you. But let's assume for a minute, and this is a good discussion, so I, I, hopefully it's useful for what we're doing. Let's assume for a minute he is lying out loud and saying, I went to this pizza thing and then doing by lie of omission the walk away. He is coached, very well coached, because he didn't verbal bridge one time. Not once did he verbal bridge. That's a great indicator. You know, that Navarro and Schaefer talk about verbal bridges, it's their term, but all it means is hiding time. And then after that, those kinds of things don't show up in this conversation. That chaff, that words that mean absolutely nothing with an occasional drift word that you want to pick up on is everywhere. And Chase, I, I get where you're going with that. I feel more like he's just accomplished as a liar because he's been doing it for a while. I'm not saying, and, and by the way, I'm not accusing and I'm not saying he is lying. I'm saying there are signs of deception in that recovery for his story. Right. Well, and I want to add to that. What I think what he's doing is distracting. And this may be very specific to a British public, uh, because this is really for the British public, in that he's, he's, he's trying to save an element of the monarchy right now, which happens in, in British history, you know, every so often. And what he's doing is giving us an image of the royal family, a royal member in Pizza Express. So that, you know, our cultural brains go, whoa, isn't that odd? What an odd image. And we fixate on that rather than the logic of, yeah, but Trump isn't open at four or five. It's like you've got, you, you have people who look after your kids. You've got security on you and security on them. You can go out anytime you like, especially in the, in the small hours of the morning or late at night. It doesn't make logical sense. This is a case of, have a look at that weird squirrel over there. Come on, look, British public, look over there. <laughs> at the same time, at the end of this thing, this is where it cues me in that he's been coached because, and not just in this one, not for this one section, but overall, here's what you do when you're being, you know, in other words, hey man, check it out. Here's what you do when you're going to lie, when you're setting this whole thing up, keep this in mind. And what he's been told is to remember every time that, that girl's name comes up, Every time a situation comes up, be sure and say, I have no recollection of, because at the end, he gets that head sideways and he almost like a gotcha moment jets in there with, and I don't recollect whatever at the very end, yeah. like he's almost laughing about it. Grab the you story. know, it's always, yeah. So that's that part where he's got to, oh, I've got to stick that in. He's Because he goes down, it's almost like he's jabbing in there with it to, to add that in at the end. So that's what tells me that, that he's had, he's, and he's had great coach. And this guy is so smart. I don't mean he's not a genius, I don't think, but God, he's, he's really smart and knows how to do that. He's done it so well up to this point. But then again, I got to give that, that interviewer, what's her name, Mark? Um, hang on. Uh, Mateless, Emily, Emily Mateless. Man, she's, she's really good at that. To not yeah. be, you know. Uh, you know, in law good to have her have her role. I mean, what's interesting about her? Uh, Cambridge ed educated, I think uh, Jesus College maybe, uh, but the only presenter of that particular show, Newsnight. There's been female presenters before. The only presenter who wasn't privately educated. So, and that will tell you one thing: is she isn't going necessarily to fall for this status 
idea. She's Canadian Isn't, too, right? She's she, Canadian. Yeah, she was uh, born uh, just up the up the road a little bit from here. So Canadian British. Uh, so he's is outside of that uh, coterie, those ranks of the aristocracy and royalty, and and so he's not going to comply so much. So I, I, I do want to go back for just a second to what Chase said, though, because I do think that's a great point when you're talking to people. If they don't remember something that is odd, maybe it's not odd for them. Just in this case, I think he's trying to stick to a story. But I think often when you're interrogating or you're talking to someone and they can't remember details because they've done it so many times, right? Subroutine. There you go. All right, we good? The world has now seen the photo that yep. Virginia Roberts provided, taken by Epstein, we understand, in Ghislaine Maxwell's house. Well, here's the problem. I've never seen Epstein with a camera in my life. I think it was Virginia Roberts' camera. She said a little Kodak one that she lent to Epstein. He took a photo, and your arm well, is round I, her listen, waist. I don't remember, I don't remember uh, that photograph ever being taken. I don't remember going upstairs uh, in the house, because that photograph is taken upstairs. Um, and I'm not entirely convinced that I mean that is that is what I would describe as as, as me in, in that in that picture, but I can't we can't be certain as to whether or not that's my hand on 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 her uh, whatever it is left left side. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so this is one of my favorites. Um, when we talk about people looking for a door, he's certainly looking for a door. He looks like he's tap dancing. If you see the sole of one foot turns up, the other is moving. This is not anything to do with an artery that we pointed out over and over and over. This is, I want to go somewhere. He's moving around. He's now nailed down. This is starting to get to the point where you're getting something viable. It's hard to say. He even says, yes, that's me clearly in the photo. But his feet are looking for a place. Both feet are active. I don't remember that photo being taken. That doesn't say the photo was never taken. Nobody took that photo of me. I mean, if you ask me, was I in the photo? No, I, somebody must Photoshop that. I don't remember going upstairs, ever going upstairs, he goes on to say, and that's upstairs. Well, how the hell do you know, excuse my English, how do you know that's upstairs? If you have never been upstairs, you're assuming, I guess. I'm not entirely convinced. That is, and falls very short of a no to me, very short of a that's not me. And he goes on, I don't think we have it in this piece of video, but he goes on to make a royal family reference immediately after this to put himself back at a higher status than everybody he's talking to when he says, as a member of the royal family, I don't often take photos and. And all of those pieces coming together look like a guy who's looking for an out. It's chaff, it's a way to get away from the, everything, and it's not a clear denial. And so, Mark, we're not dealing with the royal we here when he's saying we don't know, or we're not sure. No, I think that's he's 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 taken some advice there uh, from some photographic experts or advisors of some sort, and the advisors have have said, "Look, we we we've looked at the, we're looking at this, and nobody can prove it's a fake, so it could be a fake." That's a weird piece of logic if you untangle it. You know, you can critically think that out very very easily. But that's the coaching around this. What's interesting is um, he goes outside of what I believe his coaching is on the camera piece because he jumps on it. He jumps on it and he go and he, I think what's happening is going. I've come up with a better argument around this, which is I've never. Well, there's you know there's a there's a problem with that. I've never seen Jeffrey Epstein with a camera expecting us to go. Oh, well, no. Oh, I mean, obviously, yeah, no, you've never seen with a camera. So that, that can't be a photograph of you. He does that all through this show. Right. I mean, all well, through it comes up with stupid little, that can't be true. Right. Well, she comes with, it's not his camera. It's, it's somebody else's camera. I mean, so, so he's fried by that piece of, of um, uh, I guess, you know, uh, skill of the interviewer uh, in there. And then he goes back to his training. I don't remember. I don't remember. Suddenly it clicks in. Yes, that's right. They told me to keep saying, I don't remember. Just answer everything with, I don't remember. 
what an idiot I am. I went for my own strategy there and it just got blown out of the water immediately. That's what I think is going on. It's a, it's a horrible car crash. It's an awful, awful car crash. Chase, what do you got? My favorite thing about this whole thing is that he never says it's not me, doesn't make a denial, but even cooler than that, he does something called psychological distancing where he says, that looks like, quote, somebody I would describe as me. <laughs> or that looks like what I would describe as me. Instead of that looks like me. That looks like what I would describe as me. That's a way I would describe myself, but it might not be me. We're still leaving a little ambiguity in there. It's like he's looking at a police artist sketch instead of a photo. So I thought that was great. That was a great great illustrator of what or how to listen for psychological distancing instead of just saying me he says that and when he is getting close to saying the woman's name at the end it just trails off yeah all right the world has now seen the photo that yep. virginia roberts provided taken by epstein we understand in Gerlaine maxwell's house well, here's the problem I've never seen Epstein with a camera in my life. I think it was Virginia Roberts' camera. She said a little Kodak one that she lent to Epstein. He took a photo and your arm well, is round I, her listen, waist. I don't remember, I don't remember uh, that photograph ever being taken. I don't remember going upstairs uh, in the house because that photograph is taken upstairs. Um, and I'm not entirely convinced that I mean that is that is what I would describe as as, as me in, in that in that picture. But I can't we can't be certain as to whether or not that's my hand on 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 her uh, whatever it is left left side. Anybody else? We good? Good. Right. Yeah. She made these claims in a U.S. deposition. Mm -hmm. Are you saying you don't believe her? She's lying. That's a very difficult thing to um, answer because I'm not in a position to know um, uh, what, what she's trying to um, uh, achieve. But, but I can tell you categorically, I don't remember meeting her at all. I do not remember a photograph being taken. And I've said consistently and um, and frequently that we never had any sort of sexual contact, whatever. Once again, he's going for the, he's repeating the same, that same thing all over again. And the classic line that tells me that, that he knows he's in trouble because he says, and I always hate to bring up Anthony Weiner, but Anthony Weiner is one of my favorites to, to just wail on. But when he says, um, I can tell you this, he can't tell us anything else because they're going to get him in trouble. He's going to go to prison or whatever. And that's usually what happens. But he's saying, I can tell you this. And that's the part that's going to, that, that is going to, that supposedly shows that he's not being deceptive, that he's being, that he's telling the truth. I can tell you this. Why can't he tell us anything? Why can't he tell us any more? Because if he does tell us anymore, if he tells us anything besides that, he's going to be in trouble. What do you think about that, Chase? Well, back just a few minutes ago, he said he doesn't remember her. And now he's talking about not having sex with her. So that's, that's a little change here. And we also see, obviously, I'm sure everybody saw it, he's failing to answer the question completely. Any one of us, any normal human being would say, absolutely, she's guilty of perjury. She has perjured herself and none of that stuff is true. And we see a little bit more psychological distancing here. He's failing to use the name of the victim. And he's also saying sexual contact instead of sex. So anybody who is accusing or an innocent person has no problem saying those words. They have no problem saying the criminal t type of words, the more severe words to describe a crime. What do you got, Greg? Yeah, so a few things. You're dead on. No denial at all. First of all, did you have sex with that woman? No. I'm going to run over a couple. But here is the Bill Clinton statement. I have said consistently and frequently we had no sex, we, we had never had any sexual contact, whatever. 
that's I did not have sexual relations with that woman, Miss Lewinsky. That is his statement in the same way that Bill Clinton did. Doesn't say he's lying. Says it's a prepared and canned statement that he's worked on. He probably had an attorney working with him to make sure he said the right things. He also then, we pick up on the same things a lot of times, Chase. He said, instead of no recollection, this. No recollection. I have no recollection of that woman has been his argument all along. He's off a little bit off the reservation there. And then when he says, I categorically deny, this is one of the few times he does a straight down eye contact break, which we typically think of as submission. They know they're on the griddle and those eyes break straight down. That's not accessing. Nobody accesses like that, that I've ever seen in my life. You may access this way, that way, this way, this way, but that's breaking eye contact in a submissive fashion. Odd for him. First time I've seen it. Mark, what do you think? Yeah, I'm not going to add anything because, it, you know, it's a waste of our time and a waste of the audience's time who are intelligent enough to look at, look at what's happening there and the uh, verbal obfuscation going on to understand, you know, exactly what's happening here. I think it's been, it's been said. The interesting thing is, is we're just unpacking intellectually what everybody knows and if there's any moment in this interview that meant that next day he needed to resign this is it because isn't it a simple answer you know is she lying yes she's lying all right it would be simple well that's all we got uh, unless you guys can think of something else we need to cover Okay, well, let's throw it around the room. Greg, you want to give us your 10, 15, yeah, get, guys, second wrap-up? We, we have looked at baseline of him, and no, he has a little bit of a wonky baseline anyway, although grooming himself, Chase, to use your terms, but he licks his lips a lot, he, just who he is as he's preparing to talk. So some of the things that we see, unless it's really pronounced, are not abnormal for him. We look at baseline, and I'll always say, I am obsessed with baseline. Baseline is the only thing that matters to me. The rest of the stuff is nuance. But baseline is what tells you when something is changing. As you walk through this, if you really want to be entertained, turn the video on, turn the sound off, and turn closed captioning on and look at the sentences with 97 words and what and who and when and how in one sentence. This guy is brilliant at staying off of the topic he doesn't want to until he's not. When he gets there, he's like a worm on the griddle. We missed the one piece that I really we probably should have covered, and that's I can't sweat. That's yeah. a great piece of really, you're sweating pretty hard right now. Otherwise, he, he gets in a bind a lot of times because of a great questioner. And if you're watching this and you're, you want to do a good job of detecting lies, pay attention. You need to focus and get the person to answer questions, not allow them to give you chaff and run in another direction. Mark, what about you? Yeah, so the same. If you're out there and you're wanting to detect lies, yes, there's look at what people are saying. There's look at what they're doing. There's also look at the atmosphere that they're putting around themselves. And how are they using the narrative of that atmosphere, the idea that they're projecting about themselves to manage you and manage your compliance around the story. There's the story, and then there's getting you to join in with that story. And that they'll do with often uh, status, authority. Um, uh, sometimes they'll lower their status to do that. That's often done in the con. The con artist will get you to think that you're a higher status than you are in order to get you to engage with their story, which is too good to be true. In this situation, what this person is doing is trying to raise, constantly raise their status so the accusations couldn't possibly be true because they're too high up, too virtuous, too honorable. Chase? Well, he is too honorable. He told you himself. <laughs> <laughs> I comply. Yeah. I think uh, we, we saw management here. This was just perception management 101. And I think that there is a legitimate concern from the prince that there is something or someone out there that has information that could seriously hurt him. And what one question I would have loved to ask, and this is something that all interrogators, most interrogators know, this is, 
why do you think people do this kind of thing? I would have loved to hear his response and whether or not he denounced this stuff because it was never it was never really brought under the light. And that that might have been a mandate for the interview. Like we're going to we can talk about all this, but we're not going to bring this up. But I would have loved to bring that into light and say, why do you think people do this kind of thing and get a reaction? And that would be really telling at the very beginning of the interview. Excellent. Excellent. Well, for me, it's I agree with I agree with everybody. In, in this, Greg, when it comes to the baseline, I think we're, what we're seeing here is that a wonderfully and, and, and almost perfectly executed delivery of the information that he spoke, that he's supposed to be giving, you know, and he's giving it in that, and he's sitting in the context, like Mark's talking about, he's, he's there in, in the, in the palace or, you know, where everything looks expensive and it's all that, it's all the hoo-ha that comes along with that, you know, to set his, to put his story in. And then what Chase is talking about as far as uh, protecting himself and making sure that, that, everything's, that, it, that, that everything is cool. Although he knows something's up or that he's in trouble, he still continues to protect himself. And I think this is, I think she did a great job. The interviewer did a wonderful job at this. And I think, as, and this guy is brilliant. I know I keep saying that, but I'm telling you, this guy is so smart. I think he did a fantastic job of protecting himself as he went through there. But it's still, it's, he's still, he's, it's like a swimmer in, in, you know, protecting yourself from a great white shark. You're, he's done for. And I think he shows, I saw a lot of, of I, I will go around and talk about the percentages of, of truth uh, indicators compared to the percentages of, of, of uh, deception indicators. And when it comes to that for me, I saw a lot of truth there. I saw a lot of things him, him tell a lot of truth. A lot of things he, were t- he was telling. I'm going to give him, I'm going to say on deception, I saw about, I want to say about 80% of what he's talking about, but that, or 70 to 80%, but the rest of that uh, 30 to, uh, you know, 20 to 30% is the truth, I think, because he's, as he goes through and is telling what happened and, and, and he's relaying, you know, personal things that really did happen, but he's leaving things out, you know, the omission part of it. So that's what I think. I'm, I'm thinking it's 80, you know, uh, 70, 80% deception and then 30, 20% uh, truth. What do you so- think, Mark? Oh, yeah, ahead, I would Drake. say that the, the, the baselines that we see for truth telling for him is uh, which of Epstein's um, buildings he's been to. And, you know, just get that baseline of you've been to this place. Yes. This one. Yes. This one. Yes. I mean, if I were to look at where are we seeing the most truth, that's where I'd, I'd go to. So, so for me, I would say he is 50% truthful. I mean, 50%, let me back up. I would say he's about 50% truthful when he's talking about things. It's deception because in places because of the way he strings the pieces together. But there's about 30% chaff in this. There's so much misdirect and redirect that it's difficult to call it deception. And the true deception is when he refuses to deny something, when he refuses to admit something, Either one of those is deception. The last thing I would leave is this. You don't need to be an expert to know, to feel this, to see this. The British public figured this out pretty quickly. That's the reason he left the next day, and there's been a lot of fallout from this. We all instinctively can read some of this. We're putting words to it so that you can learn to quantify what you're seeing. That's our intent. Chase? I'm going to go with 75 deception, 25 truth. I think there are some things in there that we could see hundred percent. He was very, very honest about, I think the kids spending the evening with his kids at the pizza place that happened. And you can see the, you can see it in the behavior. There's no hesitation. There's no couching, no avoidance. So I'm going to go with 75. Excellent. I would like to think that lessons have been learned because my goodness, (laughs) some lessons did need learning. I'm Scott Rouse. I'm a body language expert and analyst, and I train law enforcement in the military in interrogation and body language. Mark? I'm Mark Bowden, expert in human behavior and body language, help people all over the world to stand out, win trust, gain credibility, including leaders of the G7. Chase? Hey, I'm Chase Houston, 20 years in the U.S. military, wrote the number one best-selling book on behavior profiling, influence, and persuasion. Greg? 
Greg Hartley, I'm a former Army interrogator, interrogation instructor, resistance interrogation instructor, and I've written 10 books on body language and behavior. Today we're going to talk about Prince Andrew. He's in the news again because of his relationship with uh, Jeffrey Epstein, but mostly because of his relationship with uh, Ghislaine Maxwell, or Ghislaine, however you say her name. Greg, tell us about the videos we're going to see. Yeah, these videos are with Emily Maitlis back uh, in, in 2019, and he, this is where he denies a lot of the things that he's now in trouble for, and that has caused him to have all of his titles taken from him. The three things we're going to look at is he says that Epstein was not his friend, which is part of his defense. The second was, I do not sweat. And the third one was, I was in working and could not have been at Tramp's nightclub. He was your guest as well. In 2000, Epstein was a guest at Windsor Castle and at Sandringham. He was brought right into the heart yes, of the but, royal family at your but, invitation. But... Uh, certainly at my invitation, not at the royal family's invitation, but remember that it was his girlfriend that was the key element in this. He was the, as it were, plus one to some extent in, 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 in that. In that. Oh. Chase, what do you got? This uh, video is a classic example of selling instead of telling. And his behavior starts right away with the submissive interjection, trying to trying to get his point across in a submissive way, which this submissive behavior is very outside of his normal baseline. And when he says key element, this is indicative of the phrases somebody writes down or is briefed before a trial or deposition. And you see even more selling when he takes this confused look to share his uncertainty about the definition of a plus one, just so he can kind of get some agreement from the other person. And this is backed up with this classic upward tone. And he even does a little of what Greg calls taffy pulling, where he's kind of pulling her along to get some agreement there. And as a quick side note, if anybody's ever hung out with Epstein and then goes on TV and they don't talk about how repulsive that behavior is or how disgusted they are by it. That should be a gigantic red flag all on its own. And that should tell you almost all you need to know. That's all I got. Greg? Yeah, let's start with how poorly his message has aged. In the beginning, this message was about, I'm not Epstein's friend, I'm Glenn's friend. Well, she's in prison now, so that didn't age well. And if he thought that was a great defense, he's in trouble for that. He alternates between confusion, that's these muscles in the middle gathering, and request for approval, holding his brow up as he tells a story. And, and Chase, you're right, he's pulling. He's trying to get that fishing thing going. He's fishing for approval. He makes way too much eye contact. And the reason the taffy pulling thing happens is because you keep your eyes connected and turn your head. It's an odd kind of a, a request for approval. But yeah, his, his message certainly didn't age well. And this will be an interesting one. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so hang on, submissive. I mean, I went on the internet and I saw that it says, you know, if people are getting good eye contact, that means they're pretty positive, they're pretty confident. Well, it, that's true until it absolutely isn't. And in this case, it absolutely isn't. Chase is absolutely right there, of course. Because if you look at his baseline, what he tends to do in interviews where he's not on the hot plate and he's really able to play that status that he has at this point, which is vice admiral, pretty high up in the Royal Navy there in and he's a royal at the same time is he won't give any eye contact at all while he's listening to other people's questions he won't give any eye contact at all while he's giving an answer he'll just flash his eyes now and again to really put a, an emphasis on specific parts of his answer here he locks a lot of eye contact. Just as Chase says, he takes up space with that but, but, but. He's literally fighting for his territory right now. And that's displayed in the way he takes up space with his words and with his eye contact there. He, he is on the hot plate here, and this is very out of character for him. Uh, Scott, what have you got on this one? I agree with you, Mark, uh, wholeheartedly, because what he's doing there at the top is he's using not only the uh, trying to speak to, as a regulator, he's using the, the but, 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 but he's also put, you know, he's also got that look of concern on his face. So in a way, he's using his expression and his words as a regulator. Regulators are the things you use to speed up or slow down a conversation or stop them. And with, those are usually done with, with your hands and sometimes with your head. But in this case, it's mostly facial expressions and what he's saying at that time. 
And while he's doing this, his head goes down and starts uh, guarding his neck because he feels, I think, he's under, he's, he's under the impression there's going to be some stress here because he's not being honest about this, as we know. Um, and he keeps throwing it up. He, he throws the uh, thing over to, like Greg was saying, over to the to his girlfriend, uh, Ghislaine, and says that he was just a plus one with her. So it's like, and, and he separates himself from that, from the, the royal family when he does the uh, illustrator he coming in like this and then he says the royal family makes them bigger and away from him so he knows he's got to separate himself from him because there's trouble there he was your guest as well in 2000 epstein was a guest at windsor castle and at sandringham he was brought right into the heart yes, of the but, royal family at your but, invitation but uh, certainly at my invitation not at the royal family's invitation but remember that it was his girlfriend that was the key element in this. He was the, as it were, plus one to some extent. In, 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 in. All right, you good? Yeah. Do you remember her? No, I, I, I have no recollection of ever meeting her. Um, I'm almost, in fact, I'm convinced um, that I was never in tramps with her. There are a number of things that are wrong with that story. One of which is that is that I don't know where the bar is in, in um, Tramps. Um, uh, I don't drink. Um, I, I don't think I've ever bought a drink in Tramps uh, whenever I was there. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, you can't miss this one. The blink rate increase, and then he progressively gets more amused with his answer. That He's got an answer for this one. And he's got that request for approval, that brow up. I almost, in fact, I am convinced yeah, okay, well, he's navigating, he stutters through the beginning of this thing. I was never in Tramp. I don't know where the bar is. I don't think I ever bought a drink when I was at, at the bar, in effect, is what he's saying. He has emotional eye accessing down to his right when he br does break eye contact at one point. And then when he's saying, I don't know where the bar is, look at his forehead, and if you have children, see the kid who spilled the chocolate milk telling you, no, it wasn't me. That is exactly the look right here. Chase, you've got a great chocolate milk story, and this, this one would be your kid trying to tell you that didn't happen. But you can't miss that all that self-amusement, but the chin down to protect the throat forces that dewlap of his out, and it's just so noticeable in him it's hard to, hard to, hard to pass up. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, let me just touch base on that chin thing. We put our, our chin down to protect ourselves and when we're in fear and keep in mind this protected our ancestors so anything that really protected our ancestors gets passed down and coded into our dna so that's why we have facial expressions and body language that all kind of matches up unconsciously so we're seeing this unconscious response to fear here and this upward tone uh which i think he's just kind of transferring or selling his uncertainty to the other person but the biggest thing in this clip is his blink rate and blink rate refers to how often we're blinking. So we can go from like uh, really slow or not very often to very often quickly. And that's an indicator of stress with a high blink rate. And low blink rate is relaxation or focus. And the average in conversation is about 15. And if somebody's really stressed out, their blink rate can be around the 50s. And in this particular video, uh, his blink rate is around 91 which is an indicative of extreme stress and extreme mental processing, which is going on. And Greg, I think that is also hilarious. I, I don't drink. I don't think I bought a drink when I was at the bar. <laughs> I don't know where it is, but that's great. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah. So, uh, this gaping mouth that we see at the start, a bit like a fish. Now, it could be a number of things. Is it, uh, he is definitely under stress. I, I agree. You see it in the blink rate for sure. And so it could be him gaping to take in oxygen. It could be him uh, doing his kind of but, 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 but silently, you know, or preparing his answer. I'm not quite sure which one it is. Either way, it's not good. Either way, it's not a good indicator, whatever it is. But I do want to bring out this upward inflection that he's got here. Just as, as, as 
Chase says there, um, we, there are some universals, some unequivocal universals in body language. That chin coming in, you know, we all have delicate areas here. All of us human beings on the planet are going to gravitate towards that under stress. Tonality can change cult culture to culture, person to person. And so if we think about his cultural tonality, being from the Royal Navy, being somebody who is royal themselves, he's going to have a lot of command downward intonation when he's very, very certain of things. And we do see that in his baseline for sure. So why here are we getting so much upward intonation as Chase pointed to there? Her story, um, uh, where the bar is in tramps. I don't drink, ever bought a drink, uh, where, whenever I was there. All of those elements that he should be certain of, he's giving upward intonation, which means he's asking for approval or is uncertain himself, uh, looking looking for buy-in. Again, it could be any one of those or all of those, whatever it is, it's not good and it's way out of his baseline. So I don't like the look of it. Uh, Scott, what do you got on this one? Uh, this is the reason I hate going last because everything gets covered. So I'll, I'll go back to the beginning <laughs> of it and do something, just do about how he's, how he's talking about things. So the answer to this is no, I never met her not no and then what are called qualifiers where you add things to make your story more believable because you don't believe it yourself because you know it's not true now the, the great thing about this interviewer when he gives an answer she just waits she just sits there and keeps looking at it and then he keeps starts adding things to, and making him un, uncomfortable so he starts adding these qualifiers that really don't mean anything and he's just digging his hole deeper and deeper and deeper and making it harder to get out um, and when he says, I've never bought it, I don't know where the bar is and I've never bought a drink. Mark and I, yeah, well, we've all talked about this. Mark's been there. It's not too hard to see the bar when you go in that place. Number one, no, that's number two. And then number one, if you've never bought, if you've been to this place a lot and you never bought anybody a drink, whether it's a, a, a girl or one of your buddies or all your buddies, remember, you're a cheap Ola, you know, this is a prince. He's got all the money in the whole wide world. He's not bought one drink at this place. Give me a break. That's, I'm not, I'm not buying that. Um, and yeah, Chase is blink right. I actually got in there and in, a, in an eight second period there toward the top, it's 17 times in eight seconds. And I had so many, it was so fast. I had to slow it down and, and do it frame by frame to catch them all. And it was, and, and in that one section, that's 127.5, um, blinks per minute. And I just added that because you always add how much it is per minute. But in that small little section, that's a whole lot. That's all that that's you're just going tick, 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 and his were fluttering. And that's a form of eye blocking as well. And we we look away or we'll block our eyes when we're for example, you'll see that when people are hearing a joke at work and they're not comfortable with it. And there are, are people around that will be embarrassed by the joke. You'll see a lot of times cover their eyes or people will close their eyes. And in this case, we're seeing him do that with this fluttering. I don't. I think at the same time, that's a combination of eye blocking and and his brain trying to come up with with an answer and to, and to make his qualifiers even more shiny as he goes along. Do you remember her? No, I I, I, I have no recollection of ever meeting her. Um, I, I'm almost, in fact, I'm convinced um, that I was never in tramps with her. There are a number of things that are wrong with that story. One of which is that is that I don't know where the bar is in, in um, tramps. Um, uh, I don't drink. Um, I, I don't think I've ever bought a drink in tramps uh, whenever I was there. All right, we good? Yeah. Let's move. She was very specific about that night. Mm -hmm. She described dancing with you no. and you profusely sweating <laughs> and that she went on to have Bath, there's a, there's possibly. A, there's a slight problem with 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 the sweating um, because uh, I, I have a peculiar medical condition, which is that I don't sweat um, or I didn't sweat at the time, and that was oh actually yes I didn't sweat at the time because I um, ha had suffered what I would describe as an overdose of adrenaline in the Falklands War when I was shot at. Uh, and I simply, it, it, was, it, was, it was almost impossible for me to, to, to sweat. And it's only because I have done a number of things in the recent past that I'm starting to be able to do that again. So I'm afraid to say that, 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 that there's a medical condition that says that I didn't do it, so therefore... <laughs> 
<laughs> wow. What a f- you know what the funniest part is? Go out and look. I sent Scott this picture when we were doing this. There's a picture of him leaving a club sweating like a f- No, man. like a pig. Yeah, man. <laughs> yeah, cool. Cool. He's a f- All right. Um, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this is one of my favorites so far. Um, I don't sweat is his defense. Okay, well, that's easily provable. And then he, I think he, even in the middle of it, realizes that is easily provable. So he has to come up with some other reason why he would sweat now that he didn't then. So he goes about navigating and telling you, well, uh, only after taking some action recently. And when he says that, he eye blocks. He eye blocks specifically at that time. In the beginning, he's uncomfortable, his chin's down. And that laugh is not a laugh of confidence. That's a laugh of, uh (laughs) uh-oh. And then he thinks he comes up with an answer, swallows a couple of times. That's discomfort. And then he goes down this story about adrenaline. Too much adrenaline caused him to get to this point. Now, I'm going to tell you, I talk about SEER a lot. In my SEER days, we have pushed people to adrenal fatigue to the point that they ball up in the floor. I never saw anybody lose the ability to sweat as a result of that. Maybe I wasn't mean enough. Don't know. But I, this is suspicious on the medical field side. Never mind, just you can tell that he's not telling the truth. All those clusters go together. You don't trust this. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, there's so much in this that I just want to concentrate on one thing that kind of means the most to me, and you can watch how it progresses. And that's when he's telling this story, how you're going to see his thumb creeping behind his index finger and then eventually get totally hidden in his hand there by the end of it. Now, just as Chase was talking about, you know, there are universal areas on our body that are universally vulnerable. It doesn't matter who you are, where you were born, who you were born to, what society or group you're part of, your joints are vulnerable. And if you've still got thumbs, okay, these thumb joints are so important because without that thumb joint working, you can't do opposable thumb pinching and you can't do any kind of delicate work with your hands, which is why you have this big neocortex primarily, so you can do all of this stuff. So these joints get really protected under stress and pressure. You'll see people do that all the time, the thumb and the forefinger, keeping those covered up. He does this beautifully in that. And that alone for me, because of the way it progresses, is a huge indicator that this story he is utterly unconfident around. Scott, what do you got on this one? All right, I agree with you 100%. At the beginning, he uses his hand, again, as a regulator, then as a barrier, as he's trying to shut. She doesn't even get to finish this, the, the question. He, he tries to shut her down. And it takes him 14 seconds to get to the part where he has a condition where he can't sweat. But, you know, and so my dad's a doctor. And I asked him, I said, hey, what, what disease is it? What, what has happened where you don't sweat? What are the situations where that comes up? And he said, heat stroke. Once you have heat stroke, you, you, you sweat out as much as you can sweat out, and you're just you're not going to be able to sweat anymore. I said, what else is there? And he said, nothing I can think of. I said, what about a, you have a big adrenaline dump? What happens at that point? He said, no, that's not going to do it either. And he explained to me there are different parts of the brain that, that handle the uh, sweating part of, uh, of what happens with your body compared to the things that what happens when you uh, have an adrenaline dump. So that I would there may be some kind of situation we're not aware of, maybe some, you know, thyroid problem or something he's got. I don't know. I have no earthly idea. So he, but I don't think that's true at that point. Um, and in the beginning, Everything is fairly big. You know, he stops and he starts. And by the end of it, he's he's almost frozen. He's almost squatted down, frozen. Mark and I are, are into to comedy. I collect old uh, uh, comedians' autographs. Mark collects memorabilia from comedians and, and funny people. And one of the things that, that we both noticed right off the right off the bat was this looked like a Ricky Gervais bit from something he's doing when he's lying, either a live thing, he's you know, one of his live shows, or when he's on one of his shows that he's done. And also look like a couple of things on there from the Black Adder, you can see that as well on him. Maybe that's just a British thing. So why he looks like the Black Adder when he's lying. But that's one of those um, things that instantly stuck out that show that he looked like a little child lying to me at that point. All right, uh, Chase, what do you got? Oh, Chase already went. No, no you didn't. No. Okay. No, didn't go. Yeah. So. Just quickly imagine that someone's reading a transcript to you and they're talking to another person. They say you're at this party, you're sweating all over these people, you're drinking, there's an underage girl walking around in her underwear. And you say, or you hear the person say, 
no, no, no. There's a problem with that. And it's with the sweating and no, nothing else is denied. Nothing else is denied. So there's no denial. It's a redirection. It's a non-answer. It's not answering the question. He goes back to focusing on these minutia that are insignificant as if the underage people are, are not an issue, but the sweating is somehow a crime that he needs to defend himself against. And then he borrows authority. He's borrowing authority from his military career, kind of redirecting the story. I was in the Falklands War. And this lack of sweat ability is called anhydrosis. It's usually, most of the time, it's medication reactions to, or some kind of genetic uh, inheritance. And extremely rare cases, I, to my knowledge uh, and in my education, uh, this happens mostly in animals that if they are attacked, uh, the receptors are receiving too much of adrenaline or epinephrine, and they start to downregulate it, which is almost never the case from what I've, from what I've uh, researched. That's all I got. She was very specific about that night. Mm -hmm. She described dancing with you no. and you profusely sweating <laughs> and that she went on to have Bath, there's a, there's possibly. A, there's a slight problem with 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 the sweating um, because uh, I, I have a peculiar medical condition, which is that I don't sweat um, or I didn't sweat at the time, and that was oh actually yes I didn't sweat at the time because I um, ha had suffered what I would describe as an overdose of adrenaline in the Falklands War when I was shot at. Uh, and I simply, it, it, was, it, was, it was almost impossible for me to, to, to sweat. And it's only because I have done a number of things in the recent past that I'm starting to be able to do that again. So I'm afraid to say that, 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 that there's a medical condition that says that I didn't do it, so therefore. Oh no, I think Greg froze. He froze, check it out. Oh my Lord, are you frozen yeah, I'm suspicious. Or not? I'm suspicious. No, he's frozen. Oh yeah, he has frozen. Should we wait on him? Well, let's, let's go around and come back to him. We'll just look at him. So it's his turn. <laughs> uh, all right, so let's throw around the room and uh, we'll all wrap it up and we'll go with Mark, Chase, and Greg. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, the biggest thing for me is that this is totally outside of his authority behavior baseline. So he's, as Greg might say, on the griddle here. Uh, this is a real worm on the griddle for him, though you might see still some levels of authority compared to how he'd normally be totally outside the baseline. That alone means something's going on here outside of the ordinary for him. Chase. Yeah, this, this whole video is, is about a sales pitch and it's not about facts. It's not about, there's no certainty and there's no denials here uh, that are confident or, or firm denials. And anytime we're watching any video, one of the first things I look at is that person's uh, level of control over themselves in that interview. That's the first thing I personally look for. How in control of themselves are they? And we see this is he is wildly out of control because he's wildly separated from his normal behavior. Greg? Yeah, I think, Mark, he missed his chance to be credible by simply not saying that never happened. That's all he had to say and move on to the next topic, not try to over explain. And you can see even when we are using this interview as a baseline, the deviations we see from it. When it gets a hot topic, you can see the difference. You see that chin protection that's pretty universal. We talk about very few things being universal, but then you see him using a little bit of chaff and redirect and lots of other ways to avoid answering the question. It surely looks like deception. Scott, what do you have? Yeah, this is just, it's a great example of a bad attempt at lying because he goes through every, every cue you can, you can just about nail in uh, deception. We're seeing him here. And the, in our regular video, and the one that this is like two hours long, we have a, a version of this. Go watch that. You'll see everything in it. But in, in, in this, we're just hitting the, some hot spots. But, I, but it's just, it's a great example of someone who's being deceptive. And we, we know he's being deceptive at this point. And I think it's just a great example all around for that.